This is a project which is um, scheduled for each year within the five-year period, 2022, 2023, 24, 25, and 26. Um, the estimated cost right now uh, for the next upcoming year is um, $25,000. This is to remove the nuisance weeds, which are located on the um, by the boat ramp area, um, by the center um, sandbar area, and the southern portion of the lake. Um, there, we do have an advisory group which is uh, helping, uh, which is overseeing the uh, activities um, within the um, lake. There, um, cost increase from last time is due to uh, the great members last year with the issues of glyphosate. Um, we found a uh, or, uh, found another so substitute for glyphosate, um, which is less harmful to the lake and also to the public, um, but it costs um, a little bit more money. The other item we have is uh, the um, compact tractor, which um, I continue um, uh, requesting. Um, uh, it's a $50,000 request, uh, but the price includes the tractor itself, a trailer, uh, and accessories um, consisting of a loader, the backhoe attachment, a auger, um, brush hog. Um, so those um, add up to the price there. Um, so those are the two items that I um, have, I'm looking for for um, capital expenses for the upcoming year. Got the it. tractor is be very useful for um, trail maintenance. It's a smaller one. It gets into some of the um, wider or wider path trails there. Um, help with erosion issues within the trail, um, smooth out any um, damage from ATV activities there, create water bars to kind of get the water going and away from steep hills there. Um, it's very preserved. I know a lot of people are familiar with it. Very popular walking site there. Um, the brush hog be extremely helpful with making sure that path stays uh, a safe width, especially um, with all the concerns regarding um, ticks and stuff like that on high grasses there. Um, we also maintain two smaller fields um, which are brush hogged um, on a regular basis there. Um, we have a small hand one what takes several days to do that activity with a small um, handheld um, brush hog that we, we have. Um, so that's um, two things there uh, and open for questions. Kevin, on that utility tractor, I have two questions. One, was this in uh, previous year's capital request? And uh, secondly, is there a utilitarian value with uh, for public works or uh, or park and recs uh, maintenance staffs? Yeah, this has been requested for at least the past three or four years um, in capital budget request. And yes, it can be utilized um, by facility, facilities department, um, public works, park and rec, because um, it's a smaller model than any of them have. So it's, um, it's great for the smaller um, finish um, landscaping activities there. Okay. Uh, anyone else have questions or comments? Uh, Kevin, I had one, one question. What was the update on the cost when you, when you uh, updated it? Was it a cost update or was it something else? For which one? Uh, I'm sorry, the um, tractor. The tractor um, I, is um, $50,000. It's no cost update from last year. Um, okay. Um, I put in when I inspected it or gave the create the quote. I also added a contingency into it. Okay. Anyone else? Kevin, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, up next, town property, Steve. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> um. First on the list is uh, Town Hall South re-roofing. Um, be stripping off all the uh, slate and turning into asphalt shingles. Plan is to make it match the Town Hall. That is for $60,000. With that would be new gutters and redoing some of the uh, exterior trim around the soffits to make it look okay. a little. You have uh, that listed at 2023. 23, yeah, Steve. Oh, it is? Yep. Oh, well, that's funny. Because all on my stuff, it says 2022. Hmm. All right. Um, Probably just an error on my end. We can, that, we can that, certainly that. move it. Yep. Uh, that's why we have meetings. Yep. Right. 
Number two, police department boiler upgrade, $90,410. It's removing the larger boilers. I was gonna replace with two smaller ones. So they only need to come on as needed, which should save with uh, all the fuel and they're more higher efficient condensing boilers. Uh, they will be tied into the building management system. So they'd have full control of them. Okay. Uh, next, uh, town hall panic alarms. There is a panic alarm system. I would like to go wireless, which would make it easier moving the desks around as, as need be. Um, we need a new new panel, which I've already put in a new fire panel. We knew, need a new uh, alarm panel, and it would be all the, uh, everybody in the building would get a uh, panic switch. So, Steve, on something like that, um what's the is the training like what's the process by which the utility of that is maximized um we just need to show everybody how to use the button there will still will be a button attached to the desk but right now that wire runs down through the floor it all ties in you got the possibility of the wire being caught or somebody moving the desk and ripping it all out so this would all make it wireless so if you move somebody's desk 10 feet you don't have to unhook it or worry about damaging anything mm -hmm. And also, it, uh, this significantly increases our ability to add to the existing number of individuals who have the panic switches because uh, we don't need to bring wiring to those, uh, those workstations. Right. And I plan on everybody getting one. This way, everybody's covered. Right. Um, okay. Next on my list is replace the old 1999 van uh, with another utility box truck with another lift gate. Um, I think it would help out because uh, we end up moving a lot of stuff. So the lift gate I know on the older truck is uh, starting to get uh, wobbly and unsafe. So this will uh, keep us up to date with another decent truck. So that, that, that's a similar question though. That's the, on this spreadsheet, it's listed as a 2024. Is that for correct. next year? That, that one is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going down in the way she listed them on mine. They're not all for. Okay. Yeah. Do all, gotcha. all next year's I can do that first. No, no, that's fine. Just keep going down your list. Okay, perfect. Um, another one for next year is replace our own Crown Vic with a little Nissan Rogue. Um, Crown Vic, the air conditioning's going, the steering's going, the body's going. It's just at the end, <laughs> light life cycle. Okay. And all what's right. that used for, Steve? That's uh. Who uses That's for the banking, um, going to the post office. Mm -hmm. um, it's Patrick running around delivering, um, you know, paper towels and supplies and whatnot to the, all the town facilities. Okay. Uh, next is the town hall exterior painting, 6,800 bucks. Um, we paint it usually every two years or something, but I figure once in a while, it'd probably be nice to have a professional come in and do all the high peaks behind the gutters, everything, and clean the building up. Uh, it seems to last about 10 years, so I think it's what money worth, well worth being spent. Okay. And finally, uh, Town Hall, Town Hall South repaved the parking lot. Um, I've pushed this back. I had put in a new septic pump. I knew I had to cut the parking lot. There was one storm drain that needed... Uh, fixing around and I didn't know if that was going to continue to erode. So I wanted to have the money there in case we all of a sudden had to repave it. But um, I talked with the town engineer. Um, I think the uh, parking lot is still in decent enough shape to push it back. So I think I push it back to uh, 2026 and that's 90,000. So okay. Steve, just, just to be clear, in 2022, we have, um, the roof for 60, the police department boiler for 90 and change, the panic alarms, the, the neat, the, and the um, painting, the, uh, yeah. the, okay. All and right. the robe, the Nissan. Oh, all yeah. oh, right, right. okay. Yeah. Right. Steve, so everything that's listed there and, and then add the 60,000 over. Right. Okay, right. thank you. Dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, Steve, the, those two vehicles that we mentioned were not in the five-year time frame last year when we did this. 
um, which is fine. But are there any other vehicles that you think might fall into the coming five years that might not be included on here now? No, because the other two trucks are in decent enough shape. I got a van that's relatively new. Mm -hmm. So I think this would, uh, this would fill up my fleet for quite a while. So you got four altogether? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Steve? Hearing none, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you all, have a good day. Matt, can I just add something quickly? Sure, certainly. Um, going back to the wireless security, um, part of that is also because we are all usually now only one person in the office at a time as far as staff, sometimes yes. one or two people on a floor. Um, and we have had instances where people come in and you know they're upset given the times. Um, so just if you would take that into consideration when you're thinking about that, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Good point. Yeah, I, I agree, Karen, thank you. And uh, just as a, as, as a sidebar, um, we are still open for business. Uh, you do not need to make an appointment to come in and meet with the assessor, the town clerk or the registrar or even uh, over at Town Hall South. Um, we are starting to see um, with the uptick in COVID cases, some of our other uh, New Haven uh, or the, the, the Council of Government towns going back to appointment only. Um, but uh, that, still, that still does not address the issue of uh, uh, less than full staff here and uh, the safety of the staff. Uh, there have been a couple of incidents where we have literally had to ask people to uh, curtail their discussions and, and, and move along. So um, thank you for that point, Karen. Uh, all right, item three, health department. Sonia, uh, Sonia Marino, I hope everyone uh, probably has not had the opportunity to meet you. Uh, I know most of the, the Board of Selectmen has, uh, has had that opportunity via Zoom, but maybe not the, uh, uh, the Board of Finance. Um, Sonia has uh, stepped into the fire. Um, there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. And of late, the, the last four weeks have been uh, torturous. Um, we basically went for five weeks ago, we went from 145 cases to 240, where we are, it was 243 this morning, I think. So, Sonia, thanks for all the work you're doing uh, and, uh, and, and the lack of sleep and uh, family time that you've had to suffer through. But uh, Want to tell us a little bit about your capital budget? Sort of a, a disadvantage for you, your first time through this, but you really all, you don't have much on there at this point. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't think I've met anyone before, Board of Selectmen, because uh, um, I wasn't available the other day. Hi, I'm Sonia. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> um, I'm also, I've never done the budget process either through here. So uh, Mary Jane, thank you very much for helping me out and Kim, the building official. The only thing that I had on the five-year capital plan is uh, a car. Um, the reason why we were asking for a car is because the inspector goes out into the field, as do I, into the, some of the same work, work sites as the building official. And we only have an old Crown Vic and another small compact four-door. Neither one of them are all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. And uh, Shirley has had, the sanitarian has had, already had one incident where she had to get pushed out of a site uh, because it was it was not developed and she got stuck. So luckily the installers were there to help her out. So that is my capital budget, just a new car or a car <laughs> that has four wheel or all wheel drive. Um, that's it. Okay. Yeah, uh, Sonia, I would uh, recommend that you I know you've, you priced out something at 26,000. Uh, was that, uh, did you work with uh, public works on that or how did you come up with that number? Kim gave me a list of, of cars to, to look through, uh, Kim, the building official. And um, I, cause I was so slammed with COVID. I really didn't have a lot of time to do research. I just looked at the cars, Toyotas, uh, I think um, to, Toyota, Honda, and then the, I think it was a Ford or something. It was anything that was around 25 that were okay. all wheel or four wheel drive. Right, and the, the Nissan Rogue would fall in that, the one that Steve looked at as well, so. Uh, oh, we'll take anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one, of, one of the considerations that I'm asking uh, all department heads, and I probably am I'm remiss, I haven't had this conversation with you, but when it comes to uh, with vehicles, Lou, you ready? Uh, 
We're looking for any opportunity to implement uh, hybrid or electric vehicles. Uh, and I understand that uh, there are more choices now relative to uh, uh, four wheel or all wheel drive vehicles uh, available in the marketplace. So uh, we'd, we'd, we'd wanna take a look at those as, uh, as an alternative. Absolutely. So, so the trend we're seeing so far, now here's three vehicles already a few minutes into the meeting and none of them were on the five-year request last year. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a way of doing this that sort of is a little more cohesive, like maybe someone could look at vehicles more broadly, all the vehicles and propose a, a, a plan that would go over five years and maybe even include some sharing where that's appropriate. I remember last year, I think we had the same conversation about getting stuck on sites, but I think it was in connection with the building department last year, I think. Yep. So maybe there are things that could be done. I mean, so like here, we just mentioned a small compact four door that you have available for use now. So that's gonna be freed up maybe for somebody else. I don't know, do we have a need for someone to take a comprehensive look at all the vehicles? I, and so I think that's a good point. And uh, Mary Jane and I will pull together with uh, working with uh, the uh, uh, public works folks because they're the ones that have the overall roster and agenda on our vehicles. So we'll, we'll pull something together that uh, shows the, uh, the year, make and model and age, you know, obviously the age of those vehicles. Uh, yeah. And there, there, is, there is sharing that's done, but there are certain departments where sharing is just not, uh, not applicable. Um, it's, it, it, but, and again, it's not unusual for both the, uh, uh, the health director and the sanitarian to be out doing in, uh, inspections at the same time uh, th uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. Because uh, they have, they have a, a division of labor relative to restaurants and then septic and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's often a need for uh, folks to, to, to be out at the same time. And I think the uh, same, same issue uh, uh, exists in the building department. Um, uh, but nonetheless, so it's a, it's a point well taken. If nothing else, it gives us an idea of the age of the vehicles and when we should expect them. And and you're right; these, you know, there should be a there should be, you know, if you if if you need to replace a vehicle today, it should have been on the capital plan uh, at some point earlier. I will say this though: that for a number of years we were discouraging uh, discouraging new vehicles, so it, it, it we may be the victim of our own uh, uh, lobbying. But that's clearly something we can pull together. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to um, I, I was going to chime in with that, Matt. Having been present at these meetings for almost counting my years as a department head, like about forty three years, and um, there were many times when the car requests were just off the table. You know, there was no discussion. It was like, no, you're not getting one this year. So uh, that's no, that's no blame. And we did have issues financial issues in 2008 that carried through for a number of years. You know, I'm not saying the decisions were wrong, but we may be just reaching a point where there's just a number of cars that we, you know, some of these are 20 years old, you know, and you know, that it's unfortunate that they're all coming at the same time, but I think it's also legitimate, so. <laughs> but my point is at, at that yeah. point, it should have gone somewhere on the next five years. You right. know, you have it this year, you don't say, oh, just never mind. Right. It's right. out, so. Yeah. Okay, Sonia, thank you very much. And uh, back to contact tracing, I suspect. <laughs> nice to meet Good you. Good luck. Uh, next up, uh, building department. Uh, Kim? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Kim in the building department. And I also uh, requesting a vehicle uh, because I also have uh, an inspector that comes in on Fridays and we have several projects that's gonna be starting before the end of this year and early next year that we're gonna probably have two, build, uh, two inspectors out, myself and another one. And right now we're down to one car. The Crown Vic that I had before has expired and the car that I'm currently driving uh, makes a lot of noise and shakes and my inspector has mentioned it several times that he doesn't feel safe actually driving it also. So that's one of the requests is for another vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I did speak to the parks department regarding uh, what type of vehicle. He did mention a Nissan Rogue. Unfortunately, that type of car is quite low. I did speak with, um, I know Janice uh, Plazic has one and she said she wouldn't even advise it, you know, because of the terrain and a lot of the work that we do, uh, that car would be too uh, low of a vehicle for something 
that I'll be doing with new construction. We have several new projects coming along that are going to be starting soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have uh, the five year there? Was there anything for building department on the five year? No, no. Okay. All right, any other questions? Um, <laughs> here's, uh, here's something that uh, just came across on a, a pink note. Uh, for those of you that don't know pink notes, that's our inner office messaging system. And Kevin McGee has reminded me that one of the issues uh, with the request for cars being as pre prevalent as they are, is that they, we are no longer getting the hand-me-downs from the police department. Uh, and I, I think you've heard Crown Vic mentioned a couple of times uh, in, in the <clears throat> past 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and that's where those cars come from. And in, in fact, uh, even the SUVs, I believe Kim's uh, black right. SUV is a, is, is a hand-me-down. Uh, mm -hmm. The vehicle I'm driving from police is a hand-me-down. So, uh, you know, that now that we are no longer able to be uh, utilizing those vehicles, it's push, pushing us into a different type of uh, purchasing arrangement. But so those are those are being traded in, Matt. The police. Uh, they are, most of them are being traded in, or they're being mothballed, basically uh, sold for salvage. Because in some ways, that um, uh, the, the, if the police, if police, if a former police vehicle would be perfect because it's the Explorer. It's obviously higher off the ground, a little more durable. But if they're if they're being ground to a nubbin by the police, maybe that's not an answer. But if there's any life left in one or two or three, some of those might be an answer. Absolutely. Okay. Anything further for Kim? Thank you very much, Kim. Have a good day. Uh, Matt, just so you know, I've been working with Charles to try to get him in the meeting. He's been having issues too. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd seen something on that. Uh, can he call in? Uh, I'm gonna have him call me now, see if I can get him in. Okay, uh, let's move along to uh, planning and zoning. Hey, there we go. George, how are you? I'm, I'm good. Um, I'm also uh, go requesting, I'm requesting a car. Can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. Okay. Um, this is somewhat repetitive of what you just heard, but um, we're requesting a uh, $30,000, which is what we think the budget price would be for a four wheel drive vehicle with a little bit better clearance than the Nissan Rogue. Um, we want to uh, use that vehicle to replace a hand-me-down from the police department. We're currently using a uh, Ford Expedition with 119,000 miles and uh, it uh, makes a, quite a number of groaning and other noises when you drive around with it. Um, the zoning enforcement officer doesn't feel real confident in its uh, functionality, and we believe it's time to replace it. So uh, that's uh, that's our request. I apologize to Sue for not having thought of this a couple of years ago, but um, good company. <laughs> yes, I think we're all in that same boat. Um, Thirty thousand dollars price came off of the state bid list um, for vehicles that are. Uh, meet our threshold. If we want to go with a hybrid, and we did look at that possibility uh, for this for a similarly uh, constituted vehicle, it's going to be a little bit higher priced, um, and that may be something that we would review sort of systematically with, as you've been suggesting, uh, uh, to replace a number of the vehicles that you're contemplating. Good. Thank you, George. Any uh, any further questions? Hearing none, thank you, George. Uh, well, item six, uh, golf course. Who do we have on? Do we have Ted and or the uh, commission? Yeah. yeah, Teddy's there. All right. Well, um, basically I have one item, um, replacing a 15 year old uh, big blower, which takes care of, of all the leaves of the golf course. Um, we basically lost it the last couple of weeks for um, basically use of the parts. Um, and it also helped me um, for the labor. 
most of our work is done with backpack blowers on it. So if we can get a bigger blower in here, we can get it get the job done and more time consuming, and also okay. save on labor. <clears throat> so that's basically the big one I have. And I would like to appreciate thanking the uh, Blackman. I guess we got the parking lot uh, somewhat on a go, correct? Correct. Correct. Ted. Um, Ted, thank you for uh, your explanation on the uh, on the blower. Um, we also had a uh, couple other items under the 22 budget. That was uh, a mower that replaces the 1994 Greens mower for 12,000, and a Toro 2300 uh, Real Master replacing a 20 year old uh, Toro. Are those uh, yeah, are you but, saying those are not critical for this year? Yeah, basically we're just going to push those back. I mean, our main thing was the parking lot. And then, you know, we just basically wanted to put in for a blower down the, you know, down the road. If we can't get it next year, we get the following year. Okay. All right. So it sounds like, sounds like yeah, you've got some flexibility with the capital then. Correct. Thank you. Any other, any questions? No. Thanks, Ted. You're welcome. All right. Next up, uh, library. I'm assuming Rob is online or hoping he is there. Yeah, the, the agenda has an estimated time of 2.30 at this point. So um, hmm. and it, so we're running up ahead of schedule. Well, then that so maybe if you want to switch and take somebody that's on the line, I see Mike Shove is on. Yeah, that works. Up, oh, Janice. You oh, Janice, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's jump to. Uh, well, is, is Tony on for uh, information systems? Or... It's going to be me, so we can do that at the end, All or right. I can do it anytime. That's fine. All right, Janice, you're on. Okay. <laughs> um. All right, so I'll I'll go through the um, the 2022. Um, capital projects that are being um, discussed for funding. Um, if you recall, we've been funding um, the road improvements um, for $500,000. Um, I believe we started last year and been looking to um, build up some funding to be able to, uh, to, to get some paving done throughout town for various roads and projects, uh, working with the public works department to try and address some, some deficiencies in some of our roads uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, the next item is uh, the Lake Quantapog Dam. Um, there's some challenges with that dam currently structurally. Uh, I have did a preliminary inspection. We're due for a formal inspection um, submission to Connecticut Deep uh, in, I believe in March of uh, 2021. And it is starting to leak quite a bit, as well as have some undermining and some leaning of the, um, the stones. Uh, it's not a high dam, but um, it obviously is an important dam. And then reviewing the plan that was done, I believe back in 2009, there was a study done for Lake Quantapog, which included um, replacement of the dam, um, replacement of the culverts for the outlet of the, the dam under lake and um, that, that weird intersection there, <laughs> um, as well as um, contemplating dredging the dam, because as you know, there's some um, shallowness on the lower end of the dam due to buildup of sediments, as well as uh, a lot of weed growth. Um, so how that gets rolled into a dam replacement project is still to be discussed and permitted and all that. But I think we need to get underway with um, some engineering studies and environmental studies to move forward to be prepared for um, you know, repair or replacement more than likely of this dam in the near future. As you can see, I forecasted out some bigger numbers for the actual construction work. So for that, I was looking for $300,000 in funding uh, for the Lake Quantapog Dam. Um, yeah. Sidewalks, uh, the annual um, 
$50,000 that uh, we've been getting for the past couple years at least in order to maintain our current sidewalks that's typically used to replace um, you know, trip and fall hazards and problem areas that I get calls and complaints on or we know exist and we need to address so that we don't have any problems as well as some compliance with uh, handicap accessibility and things like that. Uh, so that's an ongoing expenditure that we typically have. Um, and this year, it was in my five-year plan last year to, and, and prior years as well, to um, start building up a little bit towards um, funding uh, sidewalk expansion along Route 1 West. Uh, this is to try and uh, bring sidewalks further to the West where they end right now is basically three mile course. And it's my understanding is to try and really extend them out as far as we can, at least maybe to Bishops or a little further um, in order to make that connection into, into town. And then there's other areas of sidewalk we may wanna look at infilling um, on the west of uh, exit 57 on the true route one west section of town where we've started to get some of the development in that area to include sidewalk. Um, so we could see if there's any need for um, fill-ins of any of those sections as well. And as you can see, that was a request that's gonna be a multi-year request for two years for a total of 100,000. Um, so Route 77, pedestrian improvements. Um, that project is, is, is already funded. Um, it's just to make you aware that it's existing. Me and Mary Jane had a discussion to really try and identify all the ongoing capital projects. And um, you could see here, it's basically being funded by a grant um, through the federal government. And the town is responsible for the 20% match. And that, I believe was covered under the recent transfer that was approved uh, recently for the remaining funds from last year for that 20% uh, match the town's responsible for. And this will extend the sidewalks uh, from where they end just north of Adams Middle School up to Hubbard Road. And then um, sidewalk expansion, Boston Street. Uh, we have a grant already. Um, to the tune of about $287,000. It's a connectivity grant. Um, and we're, we're gonna be shy on that um, uh, grant to really bring the sidewalks based on our estimates out to Route 1. Uh, a couple challenges we have is there's a tidal uh, creek culvert that needs to be extended in order to cross uh, along Boston Street. Um, that's going to be challenging for a number of reasons, cost as well as permitting. And then we have some areas of embankment and such that we have to address as we get closer to Route 1. So our estimates are the cost of the project is 406000 but we only have $286,000. Um, but I believe those funds, extra funds, were also part of that recent transfer uh, from fund funds remaining from last year to cover that shortfall we expect in that project. Right. And then uh, finally, Nut Plains Road um, reconstruction. That is a lot SIP funded program. Um, we're still awaiting a commitment to fund from DOT. We've had our preliminary design into them and uh, they've had some comments. We've responded. We're getting them a little more information. So. Uh, we're expecting to be able to construct that next year, but that will the construction costs are entirely funded through that um, lot SIP grant that's administered through the COG. Excellent. And then, if you'd like, I can touch on some of the future projects if you like. Or yeah, yeah, I think it's good for everyone to get an understanding of what's coming down the pike here. Okay, so then um, as you can see, we're, we're, we are forecasting out for the road improvements to continue that for the next, um, for three years, we already did one year of $500,000. And then the next project would be um, Chimney Corners uh, Coastal Resilience. Uh, the town uh, used um, uh, coastal roads funds to do a, stu a study, which we've done a, a preliminary study of um, 
uh, Chimney Corners, as well as Falcon Road, which is down at the bottom on this list. Um, and working with the uh, Sachem's Head Association, and we hired race consultant engineers, and um, they've studied alternatives for resilience for both locations. Uh, Chimney Corners Road, we have a number of residences, as well as the Yacht Club, that are challenged with access due to uh, frequent flooding of the road. The road sits as low as elevation four. And so, um, you know, they'll have a, a wind and a high tide and they won't be able to get to their home. So it's a, a, a problem that we do need to address similar to what was done over on um, Old Quarry and Tuttle's Point Road where, um, you know, access to homes was challenging because of the low lying roadway. Um, and we have uh, completed the preliminary study and we had a public outreach meeting recently. We've gotten some good feedback and it's looking like it would more, more than likely be a road, simple road elevation project, but we did look at other concepts such as um, a, a flood wall or a flood berm as alternatives, but uh, probably the most straightforward and cost-effective feasible project is the true road elevation project. Um, and so we're looking to fund that project uh, to allow for uh, resilience and uh, um, improved access to those homes. Um, and then Falcon Road was also, um, as you know, we've had a number of instances where that road's been damaged due to wave action. It's, there's an old um, a stone wall, seawall that's there that doesn't have a very deep foundation and it's sub, you know, subject to, to damage. And uh, it's been a problem as well as it's low lying and you know, experiences a lot of wave wash as well as sand. So we, uh, in studying this, have looked at a, a number of alternatives. One is to replace the wall with a more resilient wall with a, a slight road elevation. Uh, we're also looking at revetments as an alternative and we're working with the, the community and, and, and trying to determine which would be the best alternative to move forward with on that one. Um, the opportunity there for that road is that it is a collector road um, through the functional classification through DOT. So we are putting that forth through for funding from COG uh, for a lot sit program uh, project. Um, we'll be working with COG I think at their next meeting uh, for um, setting the priorities as to what funding is going to be available for what projects. And we're hoping that Falcon Road will be included. So the exact year of funding availability, I'm not exactly sure, but um, this is what I put in for with them. And then above that is the Goose Lane Road Reconstruction. And that's also a lots of funded project. Um, we have had um, survey completed on that roadway. We're awaiting the final survey so that uh, internally the assistant engineer can get started on the design because uh, we own the design on all the lots of programs, but the construction is funded through the grant. Uh, so we're hopeful to get that survey in soon and get working on uh, the design so that'll be ready for construction in 2023. Once we have a preliminary design done We'll submit to DOT for a commitment to fund, and then we can move forward with uh, public outreach and permitting and all that for that as well. So that would be basically from just north of uh, I-95 up to where the Nut Plains Road uh, lot sit program project would end. And we would basically end up with that entire corridor paved over a couple of year period. It's not just paved, it's gonna be reconstructed. We have a number of problems, particularly with drainage on both Nut Plains and um, Goose Lane that the reconstruction will help solve those problems and result in a better roadway. So that's 2023. Um, 2024 includes the paving and the sidewalks and uh, also the Quantipog Dam construction costs, which I've, you know, uh, based on this study that was done in 2009, put in the estimate of about three and a half million dollars. And again, the scope of that project is gonna determine true cost, whether there's the, the desire to dredge uh, will we'll play, play a huge role in the costs of that project. Cause that's where actually a lot of the cost really lies is in the dredging costs, at least based on the study that was done in 2009. 
And then going forward, um, we pushed out Bear House Hill Road Bridge masonry, re masonry repairs and deck replacement of 150 to 2025. Um, that might that might be that's might be funded through LOSIP, and it's not really a pressing priority right now. It seems to be holding up fine. It's really a more of a pedestrian bridge and emergency access bridge into the open space. So it's holding up to wait until 2025 at the, at the very least. And then the other projects that we pushed out even further are the Nut Plains Road West expansion of Route 77 and the Bullard Drive extension of Route 77 at Baldwin Middle School. Both those projects have been contemplated for many years and were part of the uh, transportation plan. And um, while I believe one may have more merits than the other, or both may be as have high merits. One has, they both have challenges because they have either a, a river crossing or a significant wetland crossing. Um, Nut Plains Road has the, the challenge of, of a lot of private property acquisition required to do that road as well. So um, that really needs to be looked at and we're hoping to have that included in the, um, the complete streets projects that we're kicking off soon. And, um, really looking at whether the circulation is still one of the priorities that we should consider and contemplate making those extensions in the future. Thank you, Janice. Uh, just a quick question on the uh, Lake Quantipog Dam. Um, obviously the, uh, uh, the engineering money is probably gonna be well spent. The question I have is a longer term on the project itself. Um, there, there is, significant discussion about who actually really owns that lake and who has control of that lake. Uh, as I think most of you know, there's a state boat launch at the northern end of the lake. Um, and uh, we, we've had some battles with them relative to who has responsibility for managing the lake. Is there an opportunity for us to get either state or federal uh, funding for a project uh, like that with the dam, maybe Army Corps, um, you know, some, some, some other type of funding? I would hope so, but I, I can't tell you for sure. I know what that funding source is myself. And that's usually what you'll, you know, when you hire consultants to help you with these things, they're, they're better experts at these things and hopefully can find us some money. I just don't, I'm not overly aware of one. It's a, it's a class B hazard dam. It's not a high hazard dam, um, like, like, the, our, like the RWA dams in town are a higher hazard. They would cause more damage to, life and property than, believe it or not, the Quantabog Dam, uh, if it were sure that sh should break. So it's classification. Um, I'm not sure how, how much, what funding sources would be out there for it, quite frankly. But we'll, we'll definitely explore that. Thank you. All um, right, I, questions? I, questions I, yes, I had a question. Um, excuse me if this is a dumb question. <laughs> I think I'm better at morning meetings than afternoon meetings, but anyway, <laughs> I'll try. Um, in the 2022 line, um, you listed various funding sources, bond, general fund, grant, LOSIP, and LOSIP. So if we granted everything, if everything in that line came to pass, new money, quote unquote, from the town would be the first four items, the 500,000, the 300,000, the 50, and the 50. Correct. And then the, yeah, and then and then I know there's some some town mm -hmm. money under the grants, but you said that's already that already right. exists. Right. right. That's correct. Right. We've already okay. funded those. So when when we look at the bottom line of four million one hundred six thousand dollars, that's not all. That's not a request. Yeah. New money. That's, no, that's, that's those, those are case. the project total yeah. project costs. Yes. And that's the case in all five years, really. I mean, some correct. is some isn't. Okay, right. Thank you. Sandy, Sandy, if you were to look in the summary page uh, at the beginning of the oh. agenda, oh. at the very end of that, it kind of outlines general fund grants bonding and the general fund line is what we're really seeking um, funding oh. for. As Janice said, um, we did have a discussion on whether or not to bring all of these forward. We felt it was better to put them on the table so that everybody knew that they were um, going forward, it was just a matter of the, the, the funding would not be needed from the general fund. Okay, no, that's, that. It, it, I'm, it's fine. I just, okay, and thank you for that. I'll, yeah, that other page will probably be 
clearer for me. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else of Janice? Any other questions? A quick question regarding the um, money that was uh, brought from surplus to the fund balance that was committed to road repair and sidewalks. Could there be a little bit of clarification on how that would play into this? And, and is that part of the money that we're talking about that's in that designated fund that we did last month, the 475? Yeah, so it's part of um, the, the sidewalk expansion for Boston Street. I believe it was 121 thousand dollars was allocated from those funds um and then the route 77 pedestrian improvements i don't i apologize i don't have that in front of me but the local I, match for that was included which i want to say was in the order of 300 300 000 and change i think um yeah and so then i think that's i think that's it for right. for those two for 2022 yeah, yeah. the fund balance committed to uh, road repair and sidewalks was 475 uh and then uh, there was a separate allocation for uh 525 for coastal resilience which would cover the, the work for chimney corners and falcon road uh so uh, your 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 supposition was correct mike okay. thank you <clears throat> anything else just to go back to that for a second. So the grand total up for 2022 from general fund, the 2.4 million, that does, does or does not include amounts already in fund balance. And it does, right? Janice, looking, that's a total, that's are a you total looking at the summary the sheet? I'm looking at the summary sheet yeah, the very, oh. at the very bottom. I don't have the summary sheet, so I apologize. Oh, no, that, no. Yeah, this is all, all the-, no, the the, the money set aside in fund balance is not in those numbers. Okay. So on top of. So if we were to go ahead with all of these, we'd be looking for the whole 2.4 out of next year's. In, in Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. That's cumulative all departments. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Janice, thank you very much for that very detailed uh, explanation. Uh, You're welcome. All right, has uh, Rob made it on to uh... Charlie? Welcome back. Welcome back in. Yes, I'm here whenever you're ready. Thank you, Rob. You're on. Okay. Um, so uh, really, it's just two simple additional requests to what's already there. Um, I'll start with the. Um, what I try to ask for every year, which is um, computer replacement uh, technology and hardware. Um, I'll start by just pointing out that we did lose that in this year's uh, budget due to cuts during the last budget cycle. So we're a year off of this schedule. And um, the other point I like to make at the beginning is um, this request is always for really what I like to call the nuts and bolts technology for that runs the library. Um, this is not the type of stuff that the friends pay for. This is not 3D printers and virtual reality goggles and things of that nature. Um, it's not laptops that we use for computer classes or display screens. This is just like the computer that the person in circulation is using to check out a book. And this is the hardwired computer that the public is using when they come in to access the internet or use you know, Microsoft or, or things like that. Gotcha. So um, there's 78 computers currently in the library of that nature. Um, uh, 41 of them are for public use, 29 are for staff use, and eight are for sort of special purposes like the HVAC computer, um, the computer that monitors the print management software, a couple of print release terminals, things like that. Um, it also includes um, things like um, we have 14 wireless access points and a dozen receipt printers and barcode scanners and just all the things that make the basic library functions happen. Um, so if I were to replace all of this at once, the bill would probably be between seventy-five and eighty thousand um, dollars. The approach that we've taken, and this is all through Libraries Online, the consortium that we're a part of, is to just do it incrementally, a little bit every year, and that that seems to work the best. We're able to target what we're most in need of in that given year and gives us some flexibility. Um, it also gives us a relationship with Libraries Online, um, which is just ex you know amazing computer service. Um, 
they have same day service for like a important staff terminal and um, next day service for a public terminal. Um, they take care of all the warranties. They take care of all, you know, all the software issues. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's a good deal for us. Um, so I am adding under the year 2026, an additional request of $10,000 for this line for computer replacement. Um, now, as always, I'm hoping, you know, we, we're looking at different trends. This number could shrink as we use um, cheaper models or find better solutions. But given the uncertainty of this year, I'm just trying to play conservatively and just, you know, assuming something weird might come up between now and then, I, I want to have the $10,000 there in, just in case. Um, the only other addition is uh, I added a third year um, in 2026 to the carpet replacement um, schedule. Um, rather than do one massive building-wide carpet replacement, we're trying to target the most trafficked areas starting in 2024. Um, this carpet was laid down during the renovation, um, which has been 12 years ago. Um, it's, it's held up pretty well, but it, certain areas are showing some wear and tear. So uh, the idea would be we start with the, with the worst area, which would be the children's play area, which for obvious reasons is the most beat up. Um, then the teen area, then the meeting room and reference area. Um, and then I think we'd be in good shape for a while. Um, so those are really the only new requests. Um, the only big ticket item I'd like to remind everyone of is um, next year, 2022, we do have that $99,500 set aside to replace the slate roof on the old part of the library, which is I think 87 years old or something like that. Um, it's, it gets inspected every year. It seems to be holding up well, but he's, you know, our advisor just keeps reminding me like, you know, it's, that needs to get on the schedule. I'd like to keep it in next year. Um, once that's done, I feel like I can, you know, retire with a clean conscience for my successor. Uh, that's really the, the last real big ticket item I think that we'll have. I mean, there'll be plenty of little stuff, but um, that's the only thing in the sort of six figure area that I, I can anticipate ever having really. Um, so if we can pull that off and uh, keep our hardware up and running. Um, the other thing I'll just point out about this hardware is, um, you know, this has been an interesting time for libraries or as for everyone. Um, one of the services that I think we really do distinguish ourselves at is um, technical assistance. Um, lots of libraries do it. I really think we are one of the best at doing that. Um, and I think we're one of the only libraries in the state that's continuing to do it even during the pandemic. So, you know, just today, and this is often like unglamorous work. It's not the kind of thing that, like the picture of the kids around the 3D printer. This is like, you know, helping a senior citizen reset their password for the fourth time in a month. This is, you know, helping some senior citizen who thought they lost all their pictures on their phone and, and just slowly but surely walking them through these really, what's, what to them is terrifying, but what to, you know, which our technicians is not. Um, it, as I keep pointing out the senior citizen because that's really who it is. And this is sort of a population that can't be served via Zoom. I shouldn't say they can't be, they can't be quite as effectively. So we still have people dropping by the library for this technical assistance every day. And um, it's just a really big deal to be able to have up-to-date hardware um, to just help them get back on their feet, especially when they're so isolated in every other regard. And then the very last point I'll make out is um, we did have a lot of laptops to the friends for our computer classes. Um, we loaned six of those out to the town to help with the, um, the remote transition, um, which the town still has, so I'm not, I'm not saying anything, but you know, at some point we'll need those back um, just while I have everyone's attention. But that's a discussion for a later date. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, anyone have any questions? Hi, uh, Rob. Um, the $99,000 for the slate roof, which I'm familiar with as well, um, that's if we put real slate back, is that correct? No, that's that's for faux slate. The that's for the faux slate. It's more in right. the ballpark of um, a quarter of a million, I think. Um, okay, faux slate, that's fine. Okay. I believe the original quote was a little over 80 for the actual faux slate, and there was a contingency assuming there's going to be about seventeen or $18,000 of um, carpentry necessary, just quite likely. Right, and there have over the years been leaks with where the two chimney... Um, the, ch the chimneys from the 1933 building are so okay thank yeah. you and and the faux slate is some sort of composite yes it um, just looks thick it looks like a slate roof yes it's the same material that if you look at the um 
the sort of vertical edge, the, the what do you call it, the parapet that goes around the building, that is Faux Slate currently. Oh. So it would match okay. that. Now, I, I still have to get that officially passed by the historic. Uh, uh, that was my have, question. I've spoken to them informally, and they said that's likely to be fine, um, but that would still be need to be, you know, officially granted. Okay. Do you, do you know offhand the life of the Faux Slate? Yeah. Good question. I was told 50 years. 50. Okay. It's pretty good. That is pretty good. Good. Anything further? Rob, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mary Jane, we'll package you and in information systems in when we do finance, right? At the end. Unless you want to go now, your call. No, I, I can wait till the end or whatever. Thank you. I'd rather take the people that are on the call. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, Public Works, Tom, good afternoon. You're, uh, Tom, you're on mute. You got to, you need to unmute. Call the library. They'll help you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You hear me now? I can hear you now. <laughs> We got you. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. All right. Uh, looking for a grapple attachment for the 104 loader. We have uh, one that we borrowed from Killingworth, um, and we've been using it, especially during those storms that we had. It's very effective, uh, time-wise and safety-wise. Um, but it is that is Killingworth uh, that I borrowed. So we're looking for one for 104, our smaller loader, and. I'll keep that other one as long as I can. Um, so that's $15,000 estimate uh, for that. And I'm looking for that, you know, 2022. Then we have uh, the need for two Wausau nine foot plows for a total of $18,000. Uh, we're short on uh, plows in the nine foot for the secondary trucks. Uh, there is damage to some of them that we're using now, then I don't really have a backup. So that's why I'm asking for that. And that would be for 2022. Uh, the mobile truck lifts, we have four, we have six already that we're using within the bays there that these things are awesome. Um, they're able to pick up a dump truck and we can, this way we can move them from bay to bay or from garage to garage. Um, we noticed that we have another bay that with, with uh, the new uh, mechanics that we kind of need to shift them over to. So we'd like to purchase four more of those at a, a cost of 44,000. Um, these are, are better too, because if we ever did move from here, they're mobile, they, they can go right to the next uh, place that we're at. So that, that there is, I, I put out 2022, but that could be moved uh, further up if, if we had to. Uh, Bobcat loader attachment. Uh, this is a milling machine uh, that attached, they just came out with. Um, it'll mill down to six inches. It's uh, also has a 15 degree pitch on it and oscillates from left to right. Um, it's self leveling. So when, once you set it down, it, it, you run the machine, everything's by, by a button on the machine. Uh, really impressive. Um, I've been looking for something like this where our costs wouldn't be that high um, because there's a lot of spots, instead of digging out the whole pavement, I'd rather mill it and make an, an, an overlap that would hold the patch better. And also, if uh, you notice through town, the center line joints have uh, failed quite a bit. This would be a perfect machine for that. Perfect for machine for around uh, catch basins and making match points and some of the gutters that we wanna fix. So instead of having a full fledged, you know, cutting the whole thing out and redigging everything, sometimes the pavement is not in bad shape. It's the, the top coat that's in bad shape. We'd be able to mill it down to the binder and save the town money and also, uh, you know, make it our work uh, a lot easier and a lot quicker. So that's 19,000. I was looking at 2023 because I actually would like to test this thing out 
and and see what what it's what it's like. But uh, the reviews are great, great on it. So excuse. Uh, me. Uh, so Tom, you're you're leaving it in 2023, or you wanted to push it over to 2022? I'm going to leave it in 2023. This okay. will give me an option to take a look at it and, see. and see if it's what all well, that we're thinking about. Um, but this way, owning it, as we found out with the roller, is much more is much better than trying to get it when everybody else is trying to get it at the same time. And sometimes with the roller, we couldn't get it. And we had, we had to go to all these different vendors. So, you know, this is a machine that you will use for years, years going on. And it's a very useful machine. Uh, and there's attachment to a machine I already have. So I, I think it's definitely worthwhile because the cost of Tilcon alone is with a bigger miller. It's a little bit bigger. It's called a Barco miller. They're running about 375 an hour uh, to, to run those things. And that's, you know, that's just throwing away money afterwards. So this would allow us a little bit of freedom. Um, I also looking for a curb machine because our current one is over 30 years old and the actual auger system starting to wear out. <laughs> and uh, not only that parts and stuff like that for it. So this new machine is, would have uh, accessibility on both sides of the machine. So it, sometimes we have to go downhill or whatever opposite of the way we want it to work because it's only one sided our machine now. This one, I'd be able to work off both sides. We would need two new molds for it. Um, like I said, the other one is over 30 years old um, and that's 11,000 and that's 2023. Forklift, uh, we have a used forklift at this point. It gets used uh, quite a bit between us and Park and Rec over here. The problem with it is it's uh, hard rubber tires and it, it's only good for a solid surface. So you can't even get off the pavement at all. And it's limited as far as its strength, as far as the picking up capacity. So we're looking for a little bit bigger one that still would be functional for around here uh, with pneumatic tires on it, you know, so the air tires like that, so that, we, and with a little bit more lifting capability. So it, it give us more access points from around here that we can work. That's thirty thousand dollars. I put it as two thousand twenty-two, but again, that could be moved. Uh, it's not a dire necessity at this point. And the last thing, that's one of the biggest things. I don't know if Janice mentioned it, but um, the fuel tanks here are at the at the end of their life expectancy, supposedly. Um, so there, thirty years is the of the steel tank is is the life expectancy of it. So they're going to be people probably be asking us to remove these um, pretty soon. Uh, I think where they were put in in 91, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm hoping there's a grace period. And I'm also hoping that maybe we can extend the time. I talked to Janice about that too, uh, with DP. If we meet certain, you know, specs that maybe we can push it off a little bit longer, especially seeing that we're thinking about moving from the, the problem with the ground. And this would be a big project because the coordination would have to be in getting a new one in. And we still don't know where we would put it here because there's not a lot of room here. Um, and then after that, we, I have to reroute traffic and then we'd have to take the old tanks out. So I've been looking. I. I call the state I they haven't got back to me we call the company that does it they haven't got back to me yet as far as the price my estimation then would be roughly around four hundred thousand dollars to do to do all this work so that is something that I was also looking at 2022 because uh, of the immediacy of uh, the tanks lives so again I had to put some kind of number in there it's going to vary according to where we put these. And uh, if we have to go underground again, I mean, there's, there's, this is a big project. So, is there any way again, of, without, Tom, any way of getting, not just like uh, off the chart, like what the life sand is, but to have, I mean, this is a circumstance for $400,000 where it would be worth it to mm -hmm. get an, an opinion as to what the integrity of these things really is. 
Yes, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, in talking with, about with Janice and Ralph, uh, we were talking about we should bring in the guy that inspects the tanks along with the guy that, that and puts them in. The state just put them in. That's why I was trying to get a price, some kind of price from the state. And so what their cost was, but there, there's no answer over there. No matter what, they're never there and it's no answer. So, and then the company that did it, Rizzo, we were trying to get an estimate from them and they haven't got back to me yet either. So and I'm going to try to put those to be guys replaced, together. Um, they have to be replaced underground given the circumstances of maybe the lifespan of the facility. Isn't there some way of putting above ground tanks if we have to do them and then move them if we can? Or, I mean, aren't there some options yes. here? Yes. Uh, we, the thought is to put them above ground. Okay. So that this way in the, the in the exchange, it'd be put the new ones in first. Then I'd have to change the access point over here. And then we would be able to take the old ones out. So a little logistics there, but the bottom line is I'm trying, you know, I talked to Janice because when we were talking about DP, maybe they can give us some kind of extension on these tanks because these tanks have had no real issues. They've met the, on the, te the pressure test, they've, they've, they've been fine. And even Janice said there's test uh, tanks that they've taken out that once they took them out, they wish they never did because there was nothing wrong with them. These are double wall steel tanks. So if there was any breach, there's a sensor in the middle of those walls. And so far, every time that we've tested, there, there has not been any breaches, any issues whatsoever. The only issue we ever had was there was corrosion on the top plate, of the access panel going in. So we had to have that fixed. But that's something that because it was right at ground level and, and had water there a lot, um, that's the reason why that happened. But the tank itself, both tanks have been you know, we're worry free. I mean, they've, they've been great. So I would think that getting those two people together, maybe we can come up with something where we're able to extend the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'd be great if we right. go another five years. You know? We yeah. don't, we don't have a lot of time now, but um, you know, our, our own state Senator is deeply involved with environmental issues and maybe she can nudge the, the department to get back to you more quickly, you know, on the answer. Right. The answer you're seeking well, well one of the problems is yes. there's there, there's specific requirements for extending the life of the tank and some of the challenges are we don't we don't have good plans on how it was installed and if some of these things were included in the installation so we're going to work at leap you know reach out to the tank installers to see if we can confirm some of these there's like strike plates that are required i have no as built to know for sure they were installed and so if we can prove these things are in place, then there is a program through DEEP to be able to extend the life, but we're not sure we're gonna be able to qualify for that, but we will seek that out first. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing, like Tom said, is if we get above ground tanks, number one, you know, no longer have all the monitoring and liabilities of an underground tank, but also if the facility should move, you, could, you can relocate above ground tanks easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a just a word of caution. Uh, moving tanks might not be as easy as it sounds, because mm -hmm. you that process that process uh, would probably take more than a couple of days, right? Uh, oh yeah. And so how would you how would you fuel and gas your own vehicles during that interim time frame? You know. Well, what you do is uh, I've run across this problem when we had our tank red tagged in Brantford and <laughs> shut down is you work out a deal with a local vendor or something to utilize for a short term fueling at, at a, uh, you know, a gas station or something like that. That's pretty much what you have to do. Right. Or, 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 with, or, or with our provider of fuel, which is uh, located right here in town. But I don't think they, they can mm -hmm. dispense it like a gas station can. There's, yeah. You have to go to a dispense. There's, there's a solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's a solution. Gotcha. All right, and, and one of the other and, and Matt just Matt, go ahead. Uh, one of the other challenges here, Matt? I think, needs to be needs to be clear is we are asking the regulators for uh, for information and advice on our our on, on the longevity of our devices. If we get the wrong answer, we get the wrong answer, and we immediately have to deal with it. That's part of the challenge with using the regulators as our expert opinion. 
Uh, so Janice, whatever we can do to find out the, the, the uh, information that would uh, potentially allow us to get that extension and then perhaps even bring in, as Lou suggested, our own outside uh, uh, experts as opposed to relying on DEEP to do that for us. Yeah, no, we're better off using our own vendor to make those these determinations if we're going to qualify before we approach DEEP. Yep. Good. All right, Tom. Do you have uh, do you have more? Um, you had a couple of trucks. Nope, that's it. Uh, Tom, you oh, had a okay. Of yeah, that, those are already been. You're breaking up, Matt. Go ahead, Tom. You, you had some trucks and a sweeper also in that list. Yes, uh, that that's on was on the previous list there that we had. Uh, two trucks, two 10 wheelers and a pickup truck uh, the following year, uh, next year. And then we also have a sweeper the year after that, that we were looking at. And then the various uh, drainage, we continue on to $25,000 every year for various uh, drainage projects that we do. That, right. That's a continuation year after year. Okay. On the, on the two dump trucks and the pickup truck, they're all under 2022? Yes. So do you have the make and model of what they're replaced? Not the, not the, I'm sorry, not the make, but the, the, how old are the ones they're replacing? I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I don't have that information as far as that, but it's the okay. 46 truck is being replaced. Um, and I know that they're within 17 years, or whatever like that. And then uh, the 110 truck after that is the one uh, to be replaced that they're both 10 wheel dump trucks. Okay. But I don't have uh, a, 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 if they're at the end of their lives, I mean, I just don't have a date on that. Sorry. That's okay. Right. You can, you can follow up with that. We can get that info. Okay. Any, uh, any more questions for uh, Tom in public work? No. Tom, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Park and Rec, Rick, are you on? Do we see Rick? Again, we're ahead of schedule, so I will uh, email him like I did the others. Okay. Uh, next, next up would be Mike, however. <laughs> Mike. Do you want to do uh, communications and fire? I see you just unmuted and uh, and brought your video back, Mike. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't worry about it. Um, communications first, Mike. Yeah, we'll go through communications first. I have uh, Charlie and Jay are with me here. So any any questions that come up for communications? So we have a. Uh, two uh well one in the 22 or two for the 22 budget for communications one is the um radio systems ups switch upgrade uh which is it related uh and this system backs up uh, the radio sites and infrastructure for all of our public safety communications and that's for thirty thousand dollars okay and the second one is the radio systems upgrade fd and pd so uh, uh, both upgrades and maintenance for our current radio system for police, fire, and public works with our radio okay. vendor. Okay. All right. And, um, any questions uh, on those two items? Are we at uh, are we at a critical juncture for uh, those upgrades? Oh, good Jay. Are we at a critical critical? Well, yeah, a lot of the stuff's end of life, so. We kind of need, especially with the UPSs. So the UPS, right. the UPS stuff is uh, end of service life. So that's something that you know, in the event we lose power or power glitches between uh, when we do lose power to generator backup, it keeps the equipment live and there's no hard shutdowns of any of the equipment. So um, as yeah. that UPS equipment ages, that is, and the, and the switches are also attached to that. Well, the switches are end of life too. They're end of life. The switch. Okay. The end of life, the end of life is the right answer uh, for an old uh, technology guy. So, um, that, uh, that, that makes sense to me. Um, 
And in terms of the radio system upgrades, is this a timing issue? Is it, uh, is it or has that also got some? Uh, it's, some... it's a the same as the switches. Uh, that there's obviously there's a there's an IT component to our radio system, and there's also a radio component. I know it's crazy, but a lot more things are IT based. Where uh, Jay is uh, taking on a, a lot of roles where we're not paying a vendor for those things, and the actual radio equipment side of those end of service life on those same pieces and components that pertain to the radio system. So our radio vendor is working on more radio stuff and our IT, public safety IT position is doing a lot more in-house work uh, when he's here every day. Gotcha. Okay, anybody else have questions for, uh, for Mike on communications? Nope, thank you, Mike. Uh, I wanna move on to fire, please. Sure. You mean just, uh, you wanna go down our list for everything in the uh, third yeah, yeah, okay, so uh, first item uh, going down for project uh, replacement staff vehicle, uh, that's for 2023. Um, we also have, I'll uh, go down two, we also have uh, the replacement of deputy fire marshal vehicle. Both of those are spaced out um, based on a replacement vehicle cycle. So uh, 50,000, we've uh, continued last year, that's what we had. So we, that's a continuous We've been on target with uh, the price of the vehicle uh, using uh, state contract pricing and also to add the radio equipment. So uh, we've been consistently able to hold that number without, um, you know, we've, we've been doing okay with that number. Um, technical rescue equipment, that uh, is for replacement, uh, or say replacement of existing equipment and gear. Uh, for example, uh, I think in, in the uh, project proposal, we have dive equipment that's coming up on end of service life. And I included a quote in there. Um, this, like many of our projects, uh, we also um, every year entertain uh, um, federal and regional grant money. So the goal is to, uh, you know, any way we could offset the cost, just like we recently did with SCBA. This money, we're also looking to allocate in different grants, federal grants for um, to offset the cost. But in the event that we don't get the grant, uh, we're going to have to budget uh, based on expiring equipment. And uh, those are predominantly uh, focused around NFPA standards for 10 year end of service life uh, for equipment. Uh, defibrillator EKG monitors uh, are defibrillators. Those are on all of the ambulances and uh, the rescue truck for uh, obviously patient care. Those are also, we uh, received notice from the manufacturer that uh, those monitors are coming up on end of service life and they're offering a five year no interest option for replacement either to phase in over time or if you wanted to purchase all of them uh, and pay it out over the time with no interest. So that though we were notified from the manufacturer that our current existing monitors have been in service for a while are um, coming to end of service life. So getting parts and repairing them is uh, getting more challenging. Uh, ambulance remount is uh, set out to 2024. Uh, that moved, obviously, uh, unfortunately, we had a recent accident with the ambulance and uh, in the process, uh, you, the board of selectmen just approved the um, new purchase for this. So that's uh, uh, the unfortunate piece is the accident. The fortunate part is it pushed out the uh, replacement cycle. So um, it's good in that sense where it's moved it out uh, further. Uh, on the normal replacement cycle of the ambulances. Uh, we have two additional bays at fire headquarters. So that was in the budget, or this was in capital uh, last year. And that's, that's one that um, we're basically, uh, we're trying to, we're, um, uh, we need more space basically. So as long as we've been in here for 15 or 16 years, we have things that and equipment that really should be stored inside and um, looking to, uh, we have preliminary quotes of costs and stuff associated with. So um, when we get there, we can discuss further. Um, training facility, that's another one that's um, it continued. So that's something that um, every year uh, to get in a little bit more in depth about that, um, that affects our ISO rating. Uh, this past year, we went through an ISO review. There's a 2020 ISO report and a rating schedule and our um, current grade on that, we're still a class three in ISO, which is really good. Um, we are just about a class three or at a 70 point something for our score. Anything below a 70 would knock us back down to a class four. Um, one of the things particular in our evaluation uh, this past year is training at fixed fire facilities. Um, the closest fixed fire facility to us is New Haven County Fire School in New Haven 
which requires us to, uh, in order to meet the ISO requirements, we have to send staffing to New Haven uh, multiple times a year for training. So our long-term plan uh, and the long-term goal was that having a training facility here, not just uh, the other thought on it was not just fire, but police or the ability to make it useful for any public safety uh, group that needs it. So we're looking at uh, adding that to uh, maintain our ISO, to help maintain our ISO uh, ratings. Um, SCBA replacement, AFG grant. Um, at this year, we received the AFG. We received a federal grant for just about um, half a million dollars. So we're in the pro uh, process of that moving forward. That got moved out to 2023, but that will most likely disappear. Um, I'm confident that'll disappear too through our federal grant money. So again, the more we can target uh, regional and federal grant money to offset any of these costs or um, minimize the costs or hopefully eliminate them, uh, that's what we're looking to do. Um, FTIR sampling meter, that was in there. We moved that back. Um, that is one that I'm confident we'll also uh, hopefully get on regional grant money. Uh, the region supports us in a lot of ways for uh, hazardous materials responses, and that's one of them. But um, our current meter, our current meter that uh, that meter specifically sampled solids and liquids and uh, basically uh, gives us ability to quickly identify uh, substances at a hazardous materials incident. Um, but that is, it, oh, our, that current meter is at end of service life and is not being um, by the manufacturer anymore. Our thermal imaging cameras, uh, we have in 23, 24, 25. So uh, the, the past thermal imaging camera purchases, those we use to Obviously, if uh, during a fire or zero visibility uh, to look at, uh, to be able to find somebody in a house on zero visibility. So that we have staggered over three years. So we're not just bulk purchasing in one year. So it pushes our replacement cycle over time. Our replacement of the pickup truck, that's uh, also, we moved that back last year. That is a 1999. 1999 with 100 plus thousand miles and uh, miles. We use that for plowing and upkeep of all the firehouses. And that is also at end of service life. So we've uh, got our use out of that um, pickup truck and plow. And then lastly is uh, the replacement of engine 154. And that was upgraded based on current pricing of engines. That engine is a 1996, 1996 um, engine in North Guilford. And it's greater. Uh, it's greater than it's. It's. It's due for replacement. It's coming up on 2096. So, so almost 24 years. That um, is up for uh, that. That needs to be replaced. Okay. Questions on anything? Um. So, so some of these. Some of these. Like the technical rescue equipment, is that if you have ten thousand every year? Is that going to be in your operating budget, or is, is that is that proposed for bonding, or is that a, another question for another day, Matt? Um, it's it's to, it's capital expenditures to replace equipment, right, Mike? Correct. So, for ex for example, uh, like a shelf life of our dive equipment of our uh, BCs or air tanks are ten years. So we're looking to replace. Instead of asking for fifty thousand to replace, like that quote for twenty five thousand, we're looking. Yeah. Uh, we find it better to replace over time, so that way, in the event that we have to move something from one year to another, and also gives us more ability to apply for grants. Because if we had the opportunity to compete over three years for federal grants, and like SCBA, we applied for that SCBA grant for two plus years, uh, we finally got it by the second or third year. So the same thing with some of these other grants and regional funding. If we space it out over time and we can offset by using federal or regional or federal money or state money, um, I, I think it, even though the replacement cycle, we can still move stuff one way or another by a year. So, so Lou, is your question more to what belongs in the operating budget versus what belongs in a capital yeah, budget? That was that, I mean, I, that, although that answer was very helpful as well. Um, the decision of, of whether that gets bonded or op, gets folded in operating is for another day, right? That's another meeting. Yes, it is. These are oh, just capital needs and how they get funded. We'll cross that bridge when we get to the next step. Right. The, the options aren't bonding or operating. You're looking at capital. Okay. Got it. Right. Okay, got it. I, I understand. Thank you. And that essentially is going to fall around life cycles of equipment and long-term projects based on 
equipment length, length of service. So obviously the gigantic one on here are the two additional bays. I mean, what's happening now? Is there equipment outside? Um, what's, 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 what's the realistic uh, uh, option? So, you know, this building is, you know, 15, 16 years old. Uh, and, you know, over time we've, we've moved things around and we have stuff that is uh, really should be inside and uh, not outside. Um, if we're full now and looking at, uh, we're running out of space and we're storing equipment outside, uh, the next 10 to 15 years is not going to get any better. Uh, so space, I mean, yeah, we, off site, uh, there's stuff move. Basically, there's stuff off site where there's staffed uh, people at fire headquarters, and there's stuff not here at fire headquarters that really should be part of our primary response here at fire headquarters. Um, mm -hmm. Takes time. So, in like a example, you know, a trench rescue. If for instance, somebody uh, is working in a trench where there's tons of road work right now, like Boston Street, and somebody's inside and gets buried under under dirt. We have to drive to offsite location to get equipment, equipment, pertinent equipment we need for that type of emergency. Hmm. Okay. Good. Any further questions of uh, Mike and the uh, fire department? Mike, thank you very much. Very detailed. Thanks, Matt. Okay. All right. Next up, police department. Um, what do we have? Uh, Butch Hyatt and uh, Chris Massey. Chris Massey, good. Uh, is uh, Commissioner Welsh also still there? He's not here. He's supposed to be on, though. Yeah. Well, I don't see him, but uh, you maybe guys I can proceed. Send him a text. All right. Are we early, Mary Jane, again, or are we? Like You're muted, Mary Jane. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, emailing somebody else too. Um, yeah, we're a little uh, bit ahead, um, but we park and rec is on for <laughs> we we skipped park and rec. I got I got Rick to come on. Okay. Uh, Rick and Rose, I think I saw Rose as well. Perfect. Rick, Rose, uh, floor is yours. Okay, just uh, unmuting. Um, hope everybody's doing doing well. Um, so the way we uh, split up the budget this year in an effort to make it um, a little bit simpler, we submitted uh, really in three different categories, uh, community center projects versus park field projects versus uh, equipment. And so I don't know what way you'd like us to do it, Matt. Um, if it works, I'll, I'll just do each category at a time, or you want me to go uh, year? No, year? no. Let's uh, we, the way it's laid out on our uh, our documentation here has uh, the community center capital improvements first, the uh, parks and uh, uh, what is I? Let's see, the, just the general the community center capital improvements. Then um, looks like it's the field stuff, and then uh, uh, equipment. Okay, so if you if you like, I'll do it in that, that order. That order would be helpful. That way we can follow straight down the line. Okay, uh, so we also tried to do it and spread things out so that we're not like heavy, heavy loading any particular year. So we try to spread out projects and equipment uh, as much as we could to try to, to balance it out some, but also in terms of priorities and needs. So we, we balance all those things. Uh, but in the community center, um, the first one we had was $20,000 to upgrade the bathrooms. And basically that's um, this is driven really by the whole COVID thing right now. Um, and, and we know it, it may be after the fact, I hope, I hope the COVID's done by then, but it makes sense to go with um, touchless faucets uh, in the bathrooms. And while we're doing it, we really should replace the counters. I mean, they're all kind of looking pretty old. Uh, they're starting to pull away from the walls a little bit. And, um, you know, part of it's aesthetic, but the, uh, hands-free faucets and hands-free soap dispenser, I think is a, an upgrade we really should do anyway. I believe the library maybe, I believe they have hands-free um, um, equipment like that. So um, that would be the uh, four main bathrooms, two downstairs, two upstairs uh, that we're talking about. So that's 20,000. Uh, the fire alarm panel um, will be about 31 years old at the time when we, when we uh, do this. And 
upgrades would would uh, well obviously it's old it's 31 it'll be 31 years old but um it'll just be more effective more efficient more accurate if we um uh look at replacing that that's a number we got uh in speaking with um shoreline security who does fire alarm panels um so for total for 21, 22 is 70,000 dollars for the community center. The sidewalks for 22, 23, um, uh, most of the sidewalks around the building are trip hazards now. Uh, for the for for mostly for us, it's not really an issue. But don't forget, we have a lot of seniors coming in here, and the sidewalks are all starting to sink. Uh, some cases, one inch to two inches, are sinking below the level of the curb, um, and they they are a trip hazard. I mean, other than that, they're not cracking mostly. Uh, they're in pretty good shape, but it's, it's they're sinking. And so um, the number we got was based on uh, what Janice gave us is the um, square foot cost for doing sidewalks. And uh, we, we just multiplied it all out and that's 75,000 for here at the community center. Um, 23, 24, um, assuming the parking lot happens next door. And this is with the assumption that the that the house would be torn down. I know it's still a little bit up in the air right now, but we had to base it on something. And so the $60,000 is for a 50 by 20 storage building, um, which I know, uh, I believe Janice had written into the plans as um, you know, a, a, an option for uh, storage there um, next door at 52 Church Street. Uh, that number I got directly from Munger Construction. Uh, I told them it was a basic building, you know, you know heat, sorry, no heat, uh, electricity, uh, but 50 by 20, 12 foot um, uh, height. Um, and that was a, a number was at, at about um, $60,000 for that. If the house uh, is determined that the house has to be saved, then I guess we would, again, with your your guidance, um, put that toward renovations to the house because obviously a lot of work would have to be done to it, you know, to make it uh, usable. Mm -hmm. um, the window replacement, we started this two, three years ago, we started replacing windows. I believe we did all the upstairs, the second floor. We didn't do any of the first floor yet. Um, and that was part of energy efficiency. And actually some of the windows are in really bad shape. In fact, um, the facilities crew has been here this week repairing a couple of them that are, they're not, not the window itself, but the window frames are cracking, they're rotting. Um, and, um, you know, again, they're, they're 20, 28 years old, uh, 29 years old right now. So um, anyway, we, we did all the second floor windows, but we didn't do the, the first floor yet. So that, that's that number for that. The generator will be 34 years old. Um, we've talked with the company um, that maintains it and um, they, they recommend that, you know, by then it should be replaced. So uh, it'd be 34 years old and 24, 25. Um, and then the last year out, we have replacing the sprinkler heads uh, in the building, kind of, again, talking with uh, fire marshal, um, they don't last forever. At some point, they need to be upgraded and replaced. So we got a number of 60,000 for that. I think that's it for the community. So any questions on any of those before I move on to the to the next category? Um, Rick, um, hi. Um, on the bathroom uh, uh, improvements, so the community center is almost 30 years old or it's closing in on that. So this would be the first time that you would do any major um, work in those public bathrooms? Correct, other than place, replacing paper towel dispensers. I think we haven't done anything else. Lighting, you know, we've done some upgrades in lights but uh, we have not uh, done anything else. The sinks are original, the counters. Um, they, they just, they, they're, they're old, they're looking old. They. Um, um, they need upgrades. We, we need to do it anyway, regardless of COVID, um, but it really makes sense to go with the, uh, the touchless mm -hmm. uh, faucets now. Any other questions for Rick on that section? Hearing none, all right. Uh, next up is the, uh, the field stuff. Yep, okay, Matt. So um, the first one we had irrigating the um, inciting the lower Cox field. We, I believe we put that in last year's budget and we, we were given the option to do that one or the slip drains at the high school. And we chose that one, you know, the high school project, which we did. Um, and so we, we pushed back the, uh, the, the, the Cox. The number's a little higher. I think we originally had 50, 57,000, I think maybe. Um, but I, I went directly to a, a company that we've done some work with and um, I believe that's a more accurate figure. Um, 
So it would be stripping the field that's there now, stripping all the grass off of it, hauling it away, you know, the, the debris, dumping it, um, and then installing sod. And since the two upper fields are irrigated, we already have the main line going through there. We would tap into that line and run irrigation on the, uh, the lower field. So all the fields of Cox would then be irrigated. I, I think it was, I lose track of time, but I think it was somewhere around 15 or 18 years ago, we had um, done some renovations on that field, but it never, it's never been good. You know, the, the, the grass is always kind of uh, clumpy. Um, it's not good soil. It's not, it's just, just never has come out real well, no matter what we do. But a lot of that is irrigation. And we found the difference at the Adams field when you folks approved irrigation there um, about a year ago or last fall, we put it in. Um, there's a huge difference. I mean, that soccer field looks the best I've ever seen it. Um, and there's still weeds and things growing in it, but it's, it's fuller, grass is coming up and it looks so much better. Granted, there's been a lot less use on it this year. There's no question about it. But the irrigation makes all the difference in the world. You can fertilize seed and do everything you can do on these fields, aerate, irrigate, uh, aerate. But without irrigation, you got that missing ingredient. And that's sort of what we're seeing at the lower Cox field. So the upper fields are, are, are pristine. They've come out great uh, since we put that irrigation in there. So we'd like to do the same with the lower field uh, to bring that up to uh, you know, a better standard like people are expecting now. Uh, the drainage and fence replacement at Baldwin, um, we, we, we put that in for this year, this coming year. We're trying to coordinate with the school system. I know that um, Cliff Gurnham wants to put a sidewalk uh, on the, when you're driving down Bowler Drive on the right side, you know, there's one now that got, it kind of goes through the woods there. Uh, they want to build a sidewalk along the fence, but it doesn't make sense for them to put the sidewalk in before we put the drainage in. And the drainage will go right along between the fence and the road. Um, and the purpose of that is that when the water comes off the uh, parking lot, it sheds right down that little hill and, and floods out. I shouldn't say floods out, but it, it saturates that upper Little League field there. And um, there are times we can't even mow it. It's just so wet. And then it's a catch 22 of the grass grows. We can't mow it. And then it stays wet longer because the grass is higher and the sun can't get in there. Um, so there are a lot of times it's, it's not playable because of that. So uh, this drains will go a long way to help that out. And uh, if we can get this in this summer, then uh, early in the summer, then um, Cliff should be able to get a sidewalk in there. Uh, so that's a total of 103,000 for those projects for 21, 22. Uh, 22, 23, um, we did slit drains, uh, I'm gonna say about eight years ago on the outfield of the baseball field. Uh, and it worked very well, that field was, uh, some springs was not playable at all, um, but that slit drain made a, made a huge difference. And we, as you know, we just did the same thing uh, on the high school so new sod field up there and we're seeing a big difference with it. So the, the field committee would like to extend that to the football field, that back football field. Um, and again, that's a, a quote we got from a, a the same company that did the project at the high school. Um, we got an estimate from them for 38,000 and it's, um, about 300 feet, uh, linear feet of um, pipe they'd be putting in for that. Uh, and that's a reduction. Our original estimate, I think was, was around 50 or 60,000 for that. So it's a more realistic price. It's less than what we originally thought it was gonna cost. Also in 22, 23, um, the Bittner Park building, the roof is in pretty bad shape. Toilets, kind of like we we're talking about the community center. Toilets there are, are, are not, you know, they're not, they're old. And, um, the building obviously gets used a lot, uh, fall, uh, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so to replace the roof, it's about $10,000, uh, the roof and fascia. Um, the fascia board is rotting around the edge of the roof there. Uh, partitions is about 6,000 and toilets and sink upgrade and repainting the floor, uh, about $9,000. So that's 25,000 total for the Bittner building. So total for 22, 23 is $63,000. 23, 24, the Lake Quantipog bathhouse. Um, uh, again, there we want to just replace the toilets, sinks, and partitions. Uh, the partitions are metal, they're, they're rusting. Um, I think anytime we do partitions now, we're going to do what we did at, like what we did at Jacobs Beach, where they're, um, uh, they're like a plastic composite material, plastic of some sort. They're not going to rust, they're not going to corrode. Um, and the ones at Quantipog are they're metal and they're, they're rusting. Um, so that's a total of $8,000 uh, for that project. 
uh, the Adams A Little League field. We, you know, we started a process, process with the field committee a number of years ago to um, either, either every year or every other year start replacing fields, upgrading fields. And so the next one due is, is Adams A infield. Um, it, it's already irrigated. So it would just be ripping out the infield and replacing it with new sod, uh, regrading it also. Um, and then the netting at Long Hill Park is, is a, a bit of a dilemma. Um, some of the teams don't like playing there because they lose, they say they lose dozens and dozens of baseballs every year uh, over that backstop. Um, the netting is shot now anyway, it's, it's ripped. Um, it's kind of falling apart. So no matter what, we have to replace it. But we, we probably have to go higher up, do something to, to try to keep those balls in, uh, in the field more. Uh, I tell the coaches it's, 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 it's a function of bad coaching. They got to teach the kids to hit forward instead of backwards. Um, but uh, it, the foul balls go over the, over the netting there. And uh, they, they uh, don't like playing there because they lose so many balls. But we have to fix it anyway because uh, I think one of the, uh, the tropical storm we had in, in August, um, uh, it, it, uh, a, tree, a large tree fell down on the corner of that fence and it bent a pole and knocked down some of the netting there. So we, we've got to at least replace part of the netting anyway, but um, I think we can patch it to get by for a couple of years. But if we want to long-term have better use of that field, we, gotta, we have to do something better uh, higher with that netting. And then 24-25, um, we talked about this with the commission of replacing the playscape at Jacobs Beach. There are a lot of things that are a lot more modern now. Um, I believe that playscape was put in, I think around 2004. Um, so it'd be about 20 years old at that point. Um, and with the salt air environment down there, um, it, it's tough keeping up with stuff. It starts to rust. Um, and there, there are new types of um, materials that you know will, will do better in the salt environment. So that's in 2425. Uh, Same thing, Bidner Park, that playscape is even older. Um, I believe that's probably more like 1994 vintage. And um, Playscapes now are just, they're a lot different from what they were back then. They're, they're more modern, they're different challenges for kids. And um, so that's what we have for 25, 26. That's all I have on, on that page. So do you want me to go on to the next one, Matt, or any questions on? Yeah. on uh, those Matt, Matt's, Matt's on mute, so maybe if there's any questions on that section, um, yeah. any, if any of the selectmen or board of finance have a question. If none, then we can move on to the next section. Thank you. Okay, uh, equipment. Um, so 2122, uh, in this current year, we had requested a uh, a, a, a roller, an, a 2.8 ton roller, which uh, was pushed out of last year's budget. So we pushed it into this, this coming year. I'm sorry, the current year budget, it was pushed out of. So we were requesting it for next year. Uh, that would be used for um, specifically for rolling the lips on the infields. That's a problem where sometimes the ball takes a bad hop, you know, the edge of the field between the infield grass and the clay. And then on the other end of it, between the clay and the outfield grass. The ball, uh, these lifts, just, they just build up over time because of the clay and how we move clay around. Um, and this uh, would be um, heavy enough to, to knock those lifts down. Uh, we have 17 ball fields that we take care of between Little League softball and uh, baseball. So uh, that, that would get used a lot. It can also be used on grass fields where we get some of the uh, sort of clumpiness and, and ridges that happen sometimes in those fields, especially if people play on them when they're a little bit wet and they start leaving divots and ruts. Um, the roller would help us level those out and uh, make it safer playing conditions. I think we could also use it uh, in parking lots. It's heavy enough that I think it could help. If we, um, like at Jacobs Beach, we got some major potholes down there. Um, if we can scuff up those potholes and bring in some, uh, some more stone, this roller would help us uh, keep up with, uh, with that, uh, you know, more than once a year. We can get down there every month if we have to, to uh, try to uh, get those potholes out and roll them out. The seven thousand dollars for the tilt trailer uh, is would be mainly for that roller. We need a trailer for the roller, but obviously we can use it for other equipment. Um, 
the uh, grounds master for 26,000 that would replace our 2000 Toro. Uh, so that, ma that machine is, um, uh, will be about 22 years old at that point, uh, 21 years old now, I think. So, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's a six foot mower. The 43,000 is a, uh, to replace our 2005 uh, GU42, which is a, a pickup truck. We would replace it with a, uh, instead of a pickup bed, it'd be a flat bed. It'd be more functional than what we have now. Um, and uh, again, that, that'll be what, 18 years old, I guess, at that point. Um, and then the John Deere, uh, that would replace the 2000 loader we have. Uh, so the total for 21-22 and capital equipment is $159,500. Twenty-two, twenty-three. The showmobile. I think you all know that showmobile has been a, a an amazingly wonderful piece of equipment for uh, many community events. When we first got it, we thought we were going to use it just on the green, but it's been at the beach, it's been at Bishops, uh, St. George's. Um, it's rented out uh, to to various groups that use it. You know, beyond what we use it for for concerts, um, graduation. And they use it this year for graduation. The cost is significantly higher than what we originally thought. Um, but I spoke with um, Kim, our building inspector, who's the ADA coordinator. It comes with an option of an ADA lift. And I asked her, well, do we, do we need to have that? And she said, we really, we do need to have it. Uh, so that increased the cost. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the number in front of me exactly how much more, but it's more because of the ADA li lift. Uh, it's more than what we originally thought. I think it added maybe nine or ten thousand dollars to it, um, but it'll be 28 years old at that point. And um, uh, is it still functional? Yes, we could. It's still working right now. Still work for a couple of years, I think. But it is falling apart. Uh, I'm concerned about the hydraulics on it. Um, uh, much of the many of the gaskets that are used to keep water out are um, they're gone. They're just not there anymore. They crack. They break off. They rip. Um, they're shot and uh, water gets inside. I remember there was one concert a few years ago, I opened it up and there was no power because water got into the outlets and we had no power. And so we, we were able to open it um, and we let it dry out for a couple hours. And uh, by then the power, it dried out enough that we, uh, we were okay, but it was uh, pins and needles there for a little bit. Um, the $7,000 for the low profile trailer, that's uh, gonna replace a 1985 trailer. So I think we've got our, our years of use on that. Um, 16,000 for a 20 passenger bus. That's with the assumption that we can get a grant again. We've been pretty fortunate. Terry Buckley's done a great job of writing those grant requests. Um, so we're, we're banking on the, being able to get um, a grant again um, in, in a couple of years uh, to replace the uh, 2008 bus that, that right now has 116,000 miles on it. Just for a reference, when we used to lease these buses from the Greater New Haven Transit District, and they don't do it anymore, so that's why we have to get them ourselves. But when we did, um, they had to be traded in uh, at, at uh, seven years or 75,000 miles, whichever came first. And so we're at 116,000. Um, and it quite, of course, at that point, they need a lot of maintenance. And um, it seems like every week, almost, almost every week, every couple of weeks, at least one of our buses is down for one reason or another. And we're thankful we have the four buses that we have because if you have one down or two down, we're in trouble. <laughs> so we need we need the buses that we have. And um, as you know, they get a lot, a lot of miles and a lot of use. So total for 22, 23 is $201,000. 23, 24, uh, the top dresser, uh, the one we have was purchased in 1997. So it's, uh, it's old. Um, it's, uh, it's a tremendous piece of equipment. It, we use it quite a bit for uh, adding uh, topsoil or sand to the uh, ball fields, compost, whatever product we want to use. You can adjust it from, I think, a little, as little as a quarter inch up to, up to two or three inches. We've been using it on um, baseball and softball fields to add clay. So it puts a nice uh, even layer of clay down when we do that. The old way is we use a loader, drop a pile of clay, and then we just have to rake, rake it in. Uh, and hope you make it level. But this, this is a much better piece of equipment, much more efficient too than our guys just using hand rakes to, and shovels to, to, to uh, move it around. The uh, 21,200 for the Zero, uh, Toro Z-Turn. 
that replaces a two, 2013 John Deere. Um, it, again, it's another six foot mower, just replacing one that we have. Um, the, uh, I think that's 18, I think it's an 18 foot trailer that should say there, it's for the 8,000. That replaces our 2003 uh, big text trailer. And then the 15,000, um, it should be boom sprayer. Sorry, it says bloom, but it's boom sprayer. It's a boom sprayer, so we hope the, the grass will bloom. <laughs> um, but uh, the one we have now is it's a 1995. Uh, it's a, it's very it's old, so it's not a, a, a the more modern ones have enough better easier way for uh, Tony and the guys to calibrate it, so they know they're putting the right amount of uh, of uh, liquid fertilizer down or, or herbicide whatever we're using on the fields. Mostly it's liquid fertilizer. Um, so the total for 23 24 is 82,200. 2425 is another 20 passenger bus. That one, we made the assumption we won't get a grant. If we get the grant, then we save a lot of money, but we put in the full amount for that year at $85,000. And that would replace the 2009, which now has 118,000 miles. By then it's probably gonna be over 125,000 miles. Um, the Bobcat um, with a forestry cutter attachment, that, that's a, a machine that we think we could use really effectively. Uh, again, on ball fields, we could use it for snow removal if we have to. It would have a little bucket on it, get into some of the small, hard to, uh, hard to uh, get areas that hard to get at with, um, with our bigger loader. Um, but in the summer, uh, non-winter months, we would use it for uh, smaller jobs for removing clay, loam, you know, any kind of material. So 140,000 is the total for 2425. And lastly, 2526, replacing the F550 with a snow plow and a um, sander with a stainless steel body. That would replace our 2013 truck. So it'll be about 12 years old at that point. Uh, it's $95,000. We started a couple of years ago. It's more expensive to go with stainless steel body, but I, I think Public Works is doing this too. Um, it costs more, but it, it it, it really pays off in the long run. We've had some trucks that we've had to replace the body for like nine or $10,000 uh, after like 10 years, you know, after the salt and sand and all the wear and tear they get, they start to rot out. Uh, so stainless steel is the way to go, but that does increase the cost a little bit. Um, and then the passenger van, we have a 2012 uh, Chrysler that uh, we use for if, there, if there's a senior that we're only picking up one senior to bring them somewhere, it doesn't make sense to use a 20 passenger bus. So we use the, the van for that. Um, there are some driveways that are hard to get into and out of with a bus. So we use the van for that. Um, there's a podiatrist in town that has a hill of a driveway and it comes out onto Route 77. Kind of not a good idea to back out onto 77 with the bus. So if someone needs to go there, a senior, then we, we take the van for that. So um, uh, but again, it's a, a 2012, it'll be um, about 14 years old at that point. And, um, you know, we're anticipating it would need replacement. So total for 25, 26 is $127,000. And Rose, am I missing anything? <laughs> Rose is there too. She, of course, she's the chairman of the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, so I think that's, that's it on our, our, uh, our projects and uh, equipment. Um, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, anyway, uh, Rick, just a couple of questions. While they're not on the uh, 2022, uh, the showmobile with an expected life of, uh, well, it's already got 26 plus years out of it. You're probably going to get at least another couple. Uh, Mary Jane, why wouldn't we bond something like that at that price uh, at, at $180,000? Wouldn't that be considered for bonding? Uh, and then the second question is, Rick, uh, in terms of the buses, we've gotten new buses each of the last couple of years, right? Yeah, we have one uh, that should be coming pretty soon, actually. Yeah, I think last year we got one, and we have one now that, um, yes, this year. Right. So what, so what do we have for total buses, assuming the, the, the other one arrives shortly? Does that give us five or six? Mm -hmm. What are we done with the older ones? It gives us five. Uh, one of the older ones, well, in the old days, we, we traded them into Greater New Haven Transit, but we don't do that anymore. One of them we, uh, we gave to the fire department. Um, we don't need five, quite frankly. Uh, if we get this new one, the, the older one that we have now, that, that's a 2008, the plan was to uh, either trade it in, sell it, or if another department wants it, to, to give it off. Okay. 
And Rick, the only question I have on a 2022 and uh, I raised this question last year, because I know you're looking for that two ton roller um, or 2.8 ton roller versus the one ton roller. You know, how significant a difference in, 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 you know, does it make to the fields using that much uh, more weight? Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about little league fields predominantly um, and maybe the high school, high school baseball field, right? Yeah, about 17 fields, Matt, overall, 17 Little League baseball, softball fields that we have. Um, and, and like I said, we could use it on the parking lots um, and we would use it on any other fields that may get ruts and clumps, you know, when people play on them when it's a little wet and now you got the ruts. Um, we could use in those areas. Uh, the, the weight makes a big difference. Uh, when, um, when we were doing the, the irrigation project was being done at Adams, the uh, company, Winterberry, that did that, they had a model very similar to this. And Tony and I were out there, we were amazed at how, um, the way they did the irrigation, they pulled the pipe. So when they pull it, it kind of makes almost like a molehill, sort of, you know, it, it, it kind of goes up like that yeah. as they pull the pipe. But they went over with that roller, it's leveled right out. We were like, wow, it's like, you wouldn't even know there was irrigation underneath there. It really makes a big difference. The weight is, is significant difference. Okay. Anyone else with questions, Rick? For Just the second? One, one quick question, all the way back to the community center capital improvements. Um, the $60,000 for the storage building. Um, I understood that the greatest need for that um, piece of property, assuming that the house is no longer there, was parking. And I also thought in the town facilities uh, plan there, the, it, I don't know if it's all going to come to fruition, but I think there was a suggestion about building perhaps storage buildings like Bilco buildings that would be shared by more than one department. So I kind of wondered what you were going to do with that storage building. Would, would that create, would it open up storage for another department where you're storing something now? Or, you know, what, what was the need for that 1,000 square foot building? Or, yeah, that's, that's my good, question. Good, good question, Sandy. So, uh, Again, it's my understanding that the town is interested in, in um, um, selling the Graves Avenue property, you know, the, the uh, Boston Street, I should say, the old Public Works building. We have um, a lot of recreation supplies in there, like all of our camp stuff is in there, kayaks, canoes, you know, aquatic equipment. We have, uh, I think, two bays, uh, um, some portable stage, you know, equipment that we use sometimes in the community center. There's a lot of recreation stuff that's stored in there. We have no other place to put it. So I think that number one, if even if that building is still a, par, a town building, that would free up two bays that another department could use. So if we can move all that stuff out of there, we, we run out of space in the community center um, for a lot of our, our stuff here. And um, you know, we had talked I think a couple of years ago about building a shed in the far corner of our of our property here, uh, which you know is really not a lot of space to do that, but. Um, so, you know, if other departments needed to use some space here, I think that we could certainly do that. But um, I, I, I think uh, in, in the designs that of the parking lot that uh, Janice had done, in fact, I'm looking at them right now, she had a couple different options and um, they included a storage building in the options. So I think there, there's some plan to do that, uh, maybe because they know we need, we need it. <laughs> um, but again, the bottom line is, if the building on Boston Street is no longer a town building, we need to, we need to have a place to put that recreational stuff. Um, and or if the town keeps the building, we can move that stuff out and free up those bays for equipment that you know between Marina, Public Works, Parks and Rec, and um, golf course. The stuff that's in there now and facilities give more space for everybody. Okay, but technically if the Boston Street building were to go to a private uh, concern, some, some place, you, equipment that you need would have to go somewhere, but it would not necessarily require a new building next to the park and rec building. It would have to go somewhere at some point. Correct, but again, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think there was, there was not a lot of support to, to just have a wide open parking lot there, which exactly. is, to your point, we're right. We, parking was our main need there, but I think there was some, some concern of people looking at a wide open parking lot. So we, whether the house is there or we put a building up, at least it blocks the view of the, uh, the parking lot. Am I right, Matt? 
that's part of it, just the overall flow and, and breaking it up so it doesn't look like just a straight up, uh, you know, uh, parking lot over at uh, the shopping plaza, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and, and it also it also uh, facilitated the access and egress uh, pretty easily. It sort of created as a buffer uh, along those lines. That we still have some challenges uh, with that uh, that property that uh, needs to get uh, through historic district. Um, and one of the considerations there was the foliage, the planting, and the streetscape, if you will. Uh, and, and clearly, you know, some kind of uh, some kind of facility there breaks up that. Uh, um, that, that impervious surf, what, what would normally be impervious surface. So, okay, thank you. That's 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 an. I got my answer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, well, you know, to that point, though, you know, it seems to me building a a storage facility uh, at that site, uh, you know, with the historic considerations, streetscape, and the rest of it, that's got to be a fairly expensive design permanent type structure as opposed to building a a uh, I'm not going to say temporary but uh, perhaps less expensive butler type building at a different location even if it was only for a, a short period of time if uh, if it were to be moved plus we have that other building that we're talking about down uh, where public works storage it just seems that that's awful prime real estate to, to be building a new "Quote unquote storage building in, but you know that I don't want to start micromanaging Parker Rec right. at this point. But it sounds like you've already got some issues in the works there already with historic. So right. I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I would think that that's awful valuable real estate and location wise, and also uh, an expensive place to build any building that will be." Uh, that would merit that location. I mean, you, you can't start building a Butler building down there. That's no. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, this, this would be more of a storage facility, not a building. It would probably, uh, it is recommended to probably have power uh, and, uh, but no heat in it. Um, yeah, but it'd probably have to be brick and architecturally yeah, well, pretty and that kind of stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to, like you said, we, we do have some challenges with this historic district. That is, that option for a, a, a building there is one of the three design uh, options that were uh, put together uh, that uh, we're, we're sharing uh, not only with uh, Rick and Park and Rec, but also with the historic district. Uh, so we have some alternatives there. Uh, and, and then obviously, Charlie, the pricing component comes into play as well. Yeah. Well, especially with the decision we made or in the midst of making with the other property, uh, you know, part of that logic was the, to have some Park and Rec space up there too. If I'm talking about strictly storage. So even if we were to retain a, a partial piece of the existing building, knowing that it's strictly temporary for storage, you know, uh, you know, you, you've got some decisions to make there, right. but I would, uh, I'd hesitate about building downtown like that for a storage facility. So, okay. Well, thank yeah, that's why you mentioned, Charlie, too, that, it, you know, not knowing what's happening with that building, if, if it's determined that the building stays, you know, but can be used for storage, we'd have to do some renovations to it. So if you approve those funds, it could go toward that. But, you know, that's a different guess. I mean, I don't know what the renovation cost would be, um, you know, but it could be applied to it, I guess. Yeah, renovations towards a temporary storage building, you know, should be substantially different than a new structure. So. We'll see. Okay, you got some work to do on that one. You got it. So, quick question about artificial turf fields. I didn't see anything in the five year. Are we good for five years? Uh, well, I believe that's in the Board of Ed budget. We are the stadium field is anticipated to replace next year. I know they have um, uh, Castle Booze Associates is doing the um, architectural design of it now. Uh, working on bid specs. So I think the plan is to rip up the track and the field together because the track is in pretty bad shape. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, um, that's, that's going under Board of Ed. It is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but actually, you know what, I, I forgot to mention, and, and I mentioned, I asked uh, Mary Jane about this. In, in our previous last year's five year plan, we put in, um, I, I, I'm going to say around $7 million for a new parks and rec, uh, sorry, park maintenance building. 
but but I know there's a whole group working on that with public works, parks, and um, facilities. And uh, you know, I know you, you folks are talking about some property for that. So it's not in our budget anymore because somebody's already doing it. I mean, it's already being designed. I understand, or at least the study's being done. So um, I, hopefully, somebody's got it in their budget. <laughs> but we we took it out of ours because we no longer we're talking about just renovating or building something for Parks and Rec. Now it's a whole maintenance complex for um, parks, public works, and facilities. So um, again, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but we took it out of ours because it, it became a bigger project. Any other, anything else for Rick? Very quick question. Uh, Chipper in 24, was that mentioned or did I miss something? Oh yeah, you know what? Uh, you're right. I was looking at. Um, you're right. I had a, a I had a revised budget I sent over, and I for, I looked at the wrong one. <laughs> um, yeah, my mistake. That should be in there. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Just check. Just checking. Yeah. That should be in. All right. That's it. Um, there are no other questions for Rick. Thank you very much, Rick and Rose, for attending. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. I believe we're now at police department. Uh, um, Chief Hyatt and yeah. Deputy Chief, the newly newly anointed Deputy Chief. Congratulations. Thank and you, Chairman Welsh. Uh, you on as well. You're muted, so you need to unmute, Chairman Welsh. Still muted. There you go. How are we doing? Now you're doing. Now you're doing okay. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Who's making the presentation? Is it Butch or Bob or? I'll, I'll take care of it today. I think the, the chief is going to roll. All right. So, uh, in the budget for for this year, I, I'll just go across the lines because they kind of they kind of tie into each other. The, at least the first couple uh, for vehicles. Uh, I think uh, you see these numbers every year uh, in the capital budget when we put it in, and uh, we uh, we put in uh, to replace vehicles on a on a replacement cycle on the vehicles based on a couple of things: mileage and idle time. Uh, a lot of a lot of times we look at that around that hundred thousand mile marker to get rid of the vehicle. Uh, and sometimes people say hundred thousand miles doesn't sound like a lot of miles, but the problem with the police cars is the idle time above and beyond the mileage. Uh, you know, a, a, a civilian car with a hundred thousand miles might still be in pretty good shape, uh, at least on the drivetrain. Uh, patrol vehicles particularly uh, get beat up with a lot of uh, idle time, and uh, we see a lot of uh, mechanical components that have to be replaced very costly. So. Uh, the, the cycle for changing those are about 100,000 miles, roughly four to five years for every vehicle. And uh, that's that's the cost for the vehicles for the patrol or the marked vehicles for each one of the five years. Uh, there's also in there uh, in the second year, 22-23, is uh, to replace one of the uh, our soft vehicles, our unmarked, which is uh, with the detective bureau. Uh, that's, a, that's a vehicle that is not marked up with any of the police markings. Uh, but it is uh, a vehicle. on those vehicles we typically keep much longer. Uh, the, actually, the vehicle in that year that's going to get replaced will probably be a 2013 or 2014 model year. Um, and uh, we'll be replacing that or looking to replace that in 2223. Um, and the, the, the next line below that vehicle components, uh, those are the components that go, go into each one of those vehicles that uh, would be replaced in that, in that year. Uh, those components uh, are everything from lights and sirens, uh, and actually we budgeted in this year because of uh, a number of uh, items may be coming to the end of their life cycle. Uh, things like our, uh, our our mobile video cameras, our uh, radios uh, within the cars, because typically we uh, we move them from car to car as we switch out the cars to save costs. Uh, at some point during the next five years, some of those components are going to be at end of life and are gonna to have to be uh, replaced with brand new uh, equipment. So uh, I updated those numbers from last year's uh, capital budget to reflect some of those changes. And those are the numbers for those uh, 
the components that go into those vehicles. Uh, the, the, the unmarked car does get some, uh, some uh, components, not as many as the, uh, the marked cars, uh, but uh, that is also included in that 22-23 line for vehicle components. Um, under building, uh, two, uh, two areas, uh, 22-23, we have 150,000. That's been in the budget a couple of years now uh, for our roof. Uh, talking with uh, facilities uh, at the roof, we've had some leaks over the uh, so over the years. Uh, the building's uh, you know 25 years old or so. Uh, that roof is uh, again one of those things that's getting to the end of life. And before we start having some structural damage, uh, looking to probably replace that uh, and uh, get that that project started next year. Um, in in uh, in 23 24, we have a a vehicle port. Uh, Right now in the back of the, the building, we have a vehicle port where we park our marked vehicles under. We have a number of other vehicles now that are currently out in the weather, uh, much like the fire department talked about with some of the equipment they have and, and uh, adding the bays that they, they want to add. It's similar for us. Uh, we do also have a number of uh, pieces of uh, uh, equipment down at uh, Graves Avenue uh, with the un unknown uh, for how long uh, that will be available, uh, you know, trying to plan for uh, moving our vehicles out of the weather and also uh, a, a space to uh, hopefully store some of that equipment as well uh, if uh, we have to get out of Graves Avenue. And uh, actually we had that in the line for 21, 22, uh, but with COVID and everything else going on, we decided to push it out uh, a couple of years uh, for planning purposes and things like that. And the roof took, roof took priority over that at that point. Indeed, and that's and that's something that, like I said, we don't have uh, we don't have any catastrophic failures yet, but we've had some uh, have had some issues with ice and things like that. So it's something that we do want to uh, to, to uh, move forward with if we can. Um, the next area, the weapon system for tasers. Uh, if you remember, uh, last year we uh, we we came to uh, uh, to the capital uh, uh, budget uh, uh, meetings. Uh, we had uh, purchased new tasers uh, and we were able to spread out the cost of those tasers over five years. Um, we, our, our other tasers had, were about 12 years old, uh, well beyond their, uh, their normal life and we we're un, uh, unserviceable anymore. Uh, so we were required to buy new ones. Uh, so you'll see there uh, the last year, 25, 26, there's nothing in that space because uh, the year before will be the last payment on that uh, on that payment for those tasers that we already have. Uh, and we're hoping to get, uh, you know, some, uh, a number of years after that 24, 25 year uh, workable years with those, uh, those systems uh, until they become unserviceable and hopefully uh, not have a, you know, the cost in there for a while. Uh, the newest thing on, on the capital budget that, that you'll see is, is for this 21, uh, 22 is the Avigilon server. Uh, over the last couple of years, and most recently last year, um, we uh, were approved to add some camera systems uh, to the building, uh, both indoor and outdoor security, uh, to cover some areas, some, uh, some to cover uh, CALEA requirements uh, with evidence and things like that, others to cover uh, blind spots in the building for security purposes. Uh, the problem is as you add cameras to those systems, uh, the old server that we have, which is which is very old, and uh, Jay Leatherman, the IT, uh, the uh, public safety IT person, uh, uh, said, you know, we uh, we've got to move forward with a new server with more storage, particularly because we added those cameras uh, because the other one is at end of life, which we can he said we can use as a backup, um, and but a new server so it can uh, accommodate uh, storage and retention requirements for the uh, the video in the building. Um, the last line there, body armor, uh, we are on a five-year body armor uh, replacement schedule. That's manufacturer uh, uh, required replacement uh, for those, that body armor. So each year um, we try to replace, uh, rather than everybody getting replaced in the same year, when uh, body armor was originally purchased, spreading out those purchases over a, 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 a period of time. So each year we have... Uh, at least a couple of those years, about uh, six or seven uh, vests that have to be replaced each one of those years. Uh, I updated all those numbers as well because those numbers did go up again uh, for those vests. 
That's all I've got. Did I talk too fast? No, any, uh, any question? Pretty straightforward, Butch. It uh, looks con amazingly consistent with last year. Uh, the only addition is the, uh, uh, the video server. Uh, right. And how many vehicles is that? Is that three vehicles? That's three patrol vehicles. Gotcha. And uh, just uh, a couple things here to add to it as well. Uh, we, we, I think I remember last year we came to you, we were talking about doing the hybrids, and we did get one hybrid. Yes. Uh, which we use the supervisor vehicle now. So they're priced out as hybrid costs, which are a little bit more than the regular. The problem is trying to get those now. Once COVID hit and they shut down uh, the Ford plants for a while, uh, it's even hard now to get the, uh, the, the regular ones. So we're hoping right. to get some hybrids, but uh, we aren't guaranteed that. So uh, we may have some conventional ones uh, mixed in there if we can't get the hybrids. Everybody's kind of scrambling to get those now. Yeah. Yeah. Have a, uh, a charging station at the uh, at the police department, the two two twenty volt, or are you just plugging it into a, a regular standard wall unit? No, it's, it's, it doesn't have to. Well, we're not plugging in. I mean, uh, right oh, now it's a hybrid, hybrid, it's right. not a plug. Right. Okay, gotcha. So it's uh, even though there, there are electric vehicles out there, but I think those are uh, cost even higher. Uh, uh, straight yeah. electric. Yeah, because Ford does have a plug-in hybrid as yeah. well. But Probably not what you're looking for. And uh, the other thing is with the body armor, I know Hutch has mentioned this in the past when, when he was here, uh, we do apply for a grant for that body, those body armor every year, yeah. um, but it, it's not guaranteed. They tell us it's not guaranteed and it, it only covers about half of the cost. Uh, so we budget for the whole cost and hope that, uh, you know, much like a number of the other departments that certain grants uh, we, we get uh, accepted and, uh, can uh, cut that cost down. All right. Thank you, Butch. Uh, anything further? I'm pleased to Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Youth and Family Services. Now, Lou, Lou, are you running up against the timeline too? I know Mike had to leave. Now here I am. Four o'clock. I really should, I should check out. I mean, I could probably take in this last one, but I got to get up to uh, uh, Route One in, in ten minutes. Okay. Okay. So, so Youth and Family Services is very easy. They have one request. It's for next year. <laughs> um, they, it's their, um, the carpeting on the first floor. They were, they pushed it forward a year because they haven't had a lot of traffic this year and felt they could get another year out of it. Ah. Okay. So that's it for youth and family services. I'm okay, trying to I'm talk fast. Wait. So <laughs> thank you. So sorry to bug out. And uh, so Mary Jane, you have uh, you're going to cover yeah. information services. Yeah. So the last thing is is IT. Um, we have our typical replacement each year of PCs, and that should be PCs slash laptops because many of our departments and our employees have now have docking stations with their laptops um, where we, uh, for instance, the computer I'm sitting here at my mother's dining room table is the same computer I would take to work um, and use. So, so we would be replacing uh, PCs and laptops um, moving forward. So that's just our annual request. Mm -hmm. um, Munis uh, employee self-service is way out in 2024. We have a number of updates and, and new modules that we're looking to do. If you remember when we put some money aside um, at the end of last year, we had a, a whole list of things we really want to do now. So all of those things came off of this capital list. Um, they, they were on here, um, but we've identified the money for them. The employee self-service is the only one that's in the holding pattern. We're not um, ready to do that right away. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, only new thing on here is the core switch up upgrade. And um, I hope you don't ask me a lot of technical questions about that. Um, I did, uh, maybe Matt knows a little bit more. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, the Aruba core switch is our wireless switch, uh, which uh, facilitates uh, connect a wireless connectivity into our uh, core network. Right. Uh, Tony told me it, it, it gets the information all out to all the departments and keeps it all, 
all, all together somehow. So um, if you needed anything more on that, that Matt can't offer, I'd have to get back to you. <laughs> I, just, I just thought maybe we were all going to go to Aruba. So that's <laughs> hoping. Well, see, now that's, that, that that would have been my like, personal like, request, that? but that's not. <laughs> The price for all maybe, of us is good. Let's go. <laughs> maybe we need to go to Aruba to test it out. <laughs> right, right, right. Mary Jane, in yes. Rob's report from the library, he talked about six computers on loan to the town uh, mm -hmm. because of COVID and the rest of it. Are mm -hmm. they covered in some way? Are we going to get them back to the library or what, what's going to happen with that? Uh, yeah, we are going to get those back to the library. Um, the uh, laptops that were currently furnishing to even more employees now um, in anticipation of another wave. Um, we're going to be putting through our COVID line um, in the hopes of having those reimbursed so they're not identified here. Okay, so, so probably none of those positions or situations are going to become semi-permanent as far as the need for those six additional uh, machines. No, those and Charlie, those six, those uh, six uh, that we're borrowing from the library, those are pretty antiquated um, and really well, just that. Really but I figured somewhere the cost had to. Yeah. I mean, are we going to utilize them going forward in that type of? I just want to make sure that it, you know, is somewhere. Yeah, we, you know, we not everyone is going to have. You know, we have some budgetary constraints. Not everyone is going to have a, a, a laptop. Uh, we're, what we're doing is we're replacing. Uh, our, our normal replacement cycle, uh, we're now going to mobile uh, computing capacity, docking stations uh, and, and laptops so that people can actually take them home. Uh, Mary Jane did, did indicate that we made some purchases earlier this year on the anticipation that uh, we'd get some COVID funds to cover it uh, because of the requirement that we have folks work at home. Um, yeah, makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah, and then we just I also need to give credit. Uh, the Board of Education had also lent us uh, some some older uh, um, uh, laptops, which we were able to deploy as well. So, but slowly those are coming out as we uh, as we deploy uh, the newer laptops that have been acquired through our normal capital project, as well as the uh, the COVID fund. Great. Okay. Anything else on uh, IT or IS, I'm sorry, information systems, not information technology, whatever you want to call it. All right. Um, does that end our show? Mm -hmm. That's everybody. All right. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, A, the presentations, all the department heads uh, and, uh, and commission folks. Also uh, to the uh, Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance for your participation. Um, please, uh, as you go through these materials, you have questions, uh, please forward those along to us, uh, Mary Jane and myself. Um, and we will, uh, obviously, the Board of Selectmen will be, uh, you know, probably in our uh, January timeframe, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be um, making some revisions to what uh, has been presented to us or in, in the form of requests. Um, as you can well imagine, uh, you know, like every year, uh, the numbers that uh, uh, get pared down significantly. Um, you know, I think we wound up somewhere a little north of 950,000 last year. Um, I think we were originally at 1 million 16 or something or, or 60. But um, and now we're, we're, there's no question we're going to have some challenges come uh, in, in our upcoming budget. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, capital is always a pretty convenient place to go. Um, so uh, that may well be a place where we have to go again during drastic times. So, and your, any of your thoughts on uh, what you think uh, you know uh, could be expendable or pushed off, uh, or questions to that effect, we'll be happy to relay them to the various department heads. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Um, and uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, everybody. Take care. Bye.